second. Okay, welcome to the Duke Spine Institute live stream. And we promised you we were gonna be doing a fusion surgery on the lumbar and we're doing it. Uh, we've already started, it took us a while to get everything going. We had a lot to do, but welcome to our live stream. It's now May 2nd, 2023. And we're at the Duke Spine Institute where you normally watch minimally invasive surgery. This patient selected to have a open decompression and fusion done. Now he's had a prior laminectomy before. I want you to notice here. Can you see here, Henry? Yes, we can. See all this yellow stuff? This is all dead muscle. It's fat, okay? And his muscles are dead because, see all this fat? They're dead because he's had a prior laminectomy. Laminectomies kill your muscles, turn them into fat. People don't know that. That's why we broadcast so you can learn the truth. We want everyone to know the truth. Laminectomy is a bad surgery, but he's had it done before he got to me. And now I have to try to come in here and clean up the mess of the other surgeon and fix this gentleman which we're gonna do. Now he's having a four level fusion. We're doing four discs today, L2, 3, L3, 4, L4, 5, L5, S1. And right now we're doing what's called the exposure. The exposure is the part of the surgery in the beginning when the surgeon has to get himself down or herself down to the area that needs to be operated on. In this case, it's the spine, the lumbar spine. To get the exposure done, I have to peel all the muscles and ligaments off the bones. This is standard for fusion. This is what they don't show you, folks. The surgeons don't show you this because they don't want you to see what they're actually doing inside. But you wonder why you take all those pain pills afterwards. This is why. Because of all the trauma happening inside your body. Now with the Duke Laser Disc Repair, there is no trauma. Therefore, there's no pain pills and there's minimal pain after surgery. But with open back surgery like fusions, there's gonna be a lot of pain. And this is a very difficult surgery for us to do because this patient has had surgery in the past and this is all scar tissue down here from his prior surgery. It's making it a lot harder for me to do a surgery. This is not like a virgin case, right there. A virgin case is one where the patient has not had back surgery before and the tissue planes are normal and you can actually follow them down to the spine quite easily. There's minimal bleeding, there's no scar tissue, unlike this case where there's lots of bleeding and scar tissue. We're using retractors. These are called Wheaties. I'm gonna retract the muscle. You can see what's left of it from the prior surgery. I'm gonna retract it over to the side. That's how we do this surgery. This is a called a decompression infusion. And there are many different ways to do decompression infusion in the lumbar spine. You can go from the front, the back, the side, combinations. So there's lots of options for surgeons. And I choose this technique because quite honestly, um, I find this to be the best the best results for the patient. It's not necessarily the easiest. It's actually the hardest to do. However, um, it's safe for the patient, generally speaking, as long as the surgeon knows what they're doing, which I thank God I do. Now, you don't see me do many of these cases but many of you may not know that I've been doing spine surgery for about 26 years. So there was a time when this is all I did were lumbar fusions. And um, the laser surgery we currently do wasn't really readily available to patients. So we had to do something different. We had to do fusions. The problem is Fusions are what most surgeons do, and they do them because they don't know how to do the laser. 
This patient was interesting. He actually wanted a fusion. I offered him the laser surgery. He said no. He wants a fusion. So we're doing a fusion. I usually will honor my patient's requests, just so you know. I believe a doctor's job is to diagnose what's wrong, come up with a treatment plan that's the best for the patient, as well as some alternatives that will work. Give the patient those choices and let the patient decide what they want to do, as long as what the patient's choosing is reasonable and has a, a good chance of working, then I don't have a problem doing it. Now that may change in time because I am getting older and my tolerance for invasive surgery has gone down especially knowing what I know about less invasive surgery working so well. But in this case, this patient has back pain. He's had a laminectomy before, which is why there's so much scar tissue and yellow fat, because when you get a laminectomy, the surgeons are destroying your muscles. They're cutting the muscles and killing them. And that's what this patient had done already before I got to him. Okay, so I'm just dealing with the aftermath now. All right, throughout the surgery, you'll see us, we're gonna be using an x-ray machine for localization. What does that mean? Well, we gotta figure out where we are. And the way we do that as spine surgeons is we use um, usually x-rays to figure that out. So I'm gonna take my first x-ray right now. I'm just lateral to a facet joint. I'd like to know which facet joint I'm dealing with. There's no way for me to know exactly where I am 100% reliably unless I get an x-ray. So we have a special x-ray machine called the fluoroscope. And we're gonna use it right now to identify where we are. And based on what I see, we'll make some corrections and go a little further north, a little further south. Guys, when we're taking an x-ray, that means I need that to be the x-ray view, right? Nurses, so. That would be an indication for you guys to switch. All right, a little higher on the table. Shot. Perfect, so there's five, count for us. Sacrum, sacrum, L5, four, three, two. So we're at L3, L3 pedicle. All right, so Dr. Patel has done a beautiful mark out and exposure. That will not be the last time. Table down, floor out. That will not be the last time, Dr. Bernes. I need you to check the arms, make sure the fluoro is not pushing on his elbows, arm skin, anywhere. You want to check the fluoro on the patient's arms because they can get a decubitus ulcer. That won't be the last time we use the fluoro machine. We're going to use it again shortly. And I'm going to keep using it until I'm 100% sure. My cob, hello. I'm going to keep using it until I'm 100% sure where we are. Okay? and that we've exposed everything we need to expose. So why are, why are laminectomies so destructive? Everything you see me doing right now is part of a laminectomy. Peeling the muscles off the spine. That's what I'm doing. Can you guys see that with the bovie, the hot knife? Okay. There's the L3 facet, L2-3 facet, and that was the L3 pedicle which means the next facet up, which is this one, has to be, if this is the three pedicle, that's gotta be the two, three facet, right, Dr. Patel? That would make this the one, two facet, L1, L2, which means this is the one we wanna preserve as much as possible, and we're gonna put a screw up there. That will be the top level for our first screw at the L2 pedicle. So, I'm trying to preserve the facet capsule as much as possible. It's already abnormal because, well, because of arthritis. This patient also has a degree of scoliosis. All right, so I believe this is gonna be the L2 pedicle up there. Let's just get another fluoro shot and verify that. If you do spine surgery, you're gonna use the, what's called navigation and um, medical imaging, 
medical imaging to identify um, where you are in the body relative to where you want to be and make sure that you, you verify that because you don't want to operate on the wrong area. And you need to come down a little bit. That's your, all right, that's good. So there's five. We're going to count again. We always start from the sacrum. Let's start from the sacrum. Sacrum, five, four, three, two. Dr. Patel, do you agree? Yes. I'm at the pedicle of two. That's the highest I want to be. That's where our top screw will go, and the other screws will follow underneath. Perfect. Now you can see, this is important, folks. I use a Jackson Spinal Table. Jackson Spinal Table is the most important table to use. It allows the patient's belly to hang in between the supports. And by hanging, it allows the patient to have what's called lordosis of their spine, their lumbar spine, which is the curvature you want. You see how nice the curvature is right now in lordosis? That's because of the Jackson Spinal Table. These tables are very expensive. They're over $100,000 for this table. but they make a big difference in the outcome for the patient. That's why we spend the money on the table. There are lots of doctors out there that don't spend the money. They will use a regular operating room table which costs about 20 grand, 30 grand, 30,000, instead of spending 130,000 on a Jackson Spinal table. And the reason? Because the more money they spend on the equipment, the less money they put in their pockets. So you've got to find a doctor who prioritizes you, the patient, and your outcome. You don't want a doctor who's just going to try to cut corners and save money because they're going to end up harming you in the process. Okay? You don't want anybody who's willing to basically lower the quality. because they want to save more money to be more profitable. Okay, our, our costs are high at Duke Spine because, well, we're not paying the costs, we can't. Doctors shouldn't be paying for patients' care. The insurance company should or the patient should. And that said, I'm not going to compromise my outcomes and reduce the quality of our outcome to save money. I'm gonna spend whatever money's necessary in order to have the very best results for my patients. That's the way every doctor should be, suck. And that's why we do it that way. By the way, if you're interested, feel free to ask questions. We have the ability for you to type up a question while I'm doing the surgery. Remember, this whole part is called the exposure. And during the exposure, what we're exposing is the spine. And specifically, I want the spine exposed in a certain way. I want to see certain things, okay? So I'm gonna keep doing the exposure just to get the spine exposed the way I wanna see it. And for me, in case you're interested in knowing, I want to see the, um, the out to the facets, lateral to the facets, okay? If I can see out lateral to the facets, then I need a uh, cerebellum. If I can see far enough over to the facets to where the transverse process is, that means I've gone lateral enough. And that's my marker, is the transverse process where it joins to the superior articular process. All right, we're putting in some retractors. Let's see, that looks pretty dry. These are called cerebellars. So let's just take a look at the difference. Okay, this is a weedy on the left, a weedy that I'm rotating, and this is a cerebellar. See the difference? Cerebellars are meant for deeper retraction, more muscle retraction, once you peel the muscle off the spine, and weedies are more for superficial skin, soft tissues. Now, we use one of these cerebellars at the top, one at the bottom of the incision when we're doing lumbar fusions. Nice, see how bloodless the surgery is? As long as you do good hemostasis, then there's not much bleeding. I will tell you, most spine surgeons lose a lot of blood they'll lose about 2,000 cc's of blood, maybe 2,500, a surgery like this. I'm getting Dr. Berndez nervous, he's looking at me. 
I won't lose 2,500, I'll lose 50 to 100. Why? Because I have meticulous technique that I've developed over the years. And a large part of it is due to my anesthesiologist working with me to keep the patient's systolic blood pressure around 110, 120 max. Obviously, you have to take into consideration the, the patient's normal blood pressure where they live, make sure they're perfusing their kidneys, their brain, their heart, and other organs. But basically, what I'm saying to you is, if you work well with your anesthesiologist, you get that patient's blood pressure down into a great low zone where they're getting perfused up here, but you're not um, bleeding a lot because you've got the pressure down. That's where you want to be. All right, we're in the laminectomy area. This is the area. This the reason why I'm doing this surgery, by the way, to help the patient, obviously, but. There aren't many surgeons willing to do revision surgery. Why? It's hard. This is hard. See what I'm doing? I'm peeling scar tissue from dead muscle from the last laminectomy. I'm peeling it off his spine. And the problem is, just right over here, is the fecal sac, probably, which is where the nerves are. And spine surgeons are scared to death of those things. So am I. You have to respect them. You have to know where they are. And if the other surgeon happened to get into that fecal sac during his surgery or her surgery, guess what? We're going to have a spinal fluid leak, which is going to suck. Which is, again, one of the reasons I don't like doing open surgery. You don't get spinal fluid leaks with the Duke laser disc repair endoscopic surgery. You get it with open surgeries. Now, I don't really get spinal fluid leaks because I'm very careful. But if there's one already here, I'm going to find it soon, and that's going to be a problem for this patient and for the surgeon. So a lot of surgeons won't do revision spine surgery. I'm not afraid of doing revision spine surgery because I've done so much of it. I'm pretty darn good at it. So I don't mind getting in here and getting my hands dirty to try to help my patient get better. But this is why we don't do laminectomies, folks. A lot of spine surgeons are still doing laminectomies. And I'm trying to get people to stop doing them because when you come back later, it's gonna be a mess. And that's exactly what we're dealing with. Yes, they're damaging to your body, but trying to fix your back after you've had a laminectomy, we call that post-laminectomy syndrome, is so hard to do. And I'm telling you that I'm a dying breed. There's not going to be many surgeons out there willing to do revision work because it's super hard, it's tedious, it's dangerous. And frankly, I could get a lot more surgeries done in a short time and not have to do such a long, complicated surgery. So it's more for selfish reasons than anything, but spine surgeons are definitely selfish people. If you, have, if you don't know that, well, sorry to be the one to tell you, but it's true. Most doctors are. They don't want to do hard work. they rather have the easy cases. His spine is seriously twisted. I don't know if you guys can see that. Can you appreciate how twisted it is, Henry, on that picture? I believe so, yes. It's literally twisting like this. So we got all that scoliosis. Weedy, I'm going to put the weedy back in. See how invasive this is compared to the Duke laser disc repair? For those of you who watch us regularly, I mean, the Duke, let me have a marker. The Duke laser disc repair, this whole surgery will be done. Are you kidding me, Luis? The, the Duke laser disc repair would be done with an incision this big. You guys see that? The whole surgery. Yes, we do. None of this meat and potato stuff. All right. We're making good progress. I'm feeling with my finger, I'm feeling for bone. Did that other surgeon leave any bone on top of the spine? And I kind of feel some bone here. It's hard to tell. His spine is so twisted. Anyway, if you have questions, feel free to type them up. This is gonna be the L5-S1 facet joint right here. A lot of fat around it. Anybody know why there's so much fat around the joint? Dr. Patel, you know. Inflammation, that's right. 
inflammation costs a lot of energy and what better source of energy than fat the hu fat is the, the the most concentrated source of energy in an animal fat so you know your body stockpiles energy near where it's needed and inflammation is like your body going into war right so it's, it's stockpiling energy here's another one these facets are extremely abnormal a lot of inflammation going on here and also what's interesting is you can see why why rhizotomies don't work irrigation they don't work because thank you Luis. that's it's enough they don't work because there's so much scar tissue here that the the pain management doctor can do a rhizotomy but he's not going to get the nerve he can try but can't get through all that scar tissue bipolar actually i think i got it all right suck here or irrigate irrigate so basically, we're using two types of hemostasis. One is a bipolar, where we cook between the tips. The other is the bovi. And right now, the primary form of hemostasis is the bovi. We have the expiral. I don't need it now, but I just want to make sure we've got it. All right. So suck, please. Now the exposure is gonna take the longest for us for this case. And the exposure should normally take around 45 minutes. It'll take us an hour and a half. And his facets are really lateral. Wonderful. More good news. We have a couple questions. Uh, we'll take them. This first one comes from Darren on Facebook. Hi, Darren. Asking, is there an optimal patient weight for a range for fusion and laser? Is there an optimal patient weight and range for fusion and laser? Great question. I mean, obviously, normal weight is best. We do take obese patients all the time. Um, the, the heavier patients are, I think it just makes the surgery harder but it doesn't mean we can't get it done. We can still get it done. So just ideal body weight is what I would say. You know, you can look all that up online, but we don't discriminate against people based on weight. We'll, we'll still do surgery on people. There's a transverse process right there. See that Dr. Patel, PP? That's our target right there, folks, for the plasma rhizotomy all right so I know it's hard to tell what's really going on in here for you all but basically I'll just do a quick anatomy the sacrum or tailbone is down at the bottom here um, and the spine is you know twisted so why is his spine so twisted folks well he had a laminectomy when you go in the back here and you cut the bones and the ligaments out back here that are supporting the spine by doing a laminectomy, the spine is gonna get unstable. And it's just a matter of time before patient comes back for fusion. So I don't recommend laminectomies anymore because they always result in fusion. If the patient lives long enough, you'll need a fusion. All right, other questions. Here's the sacrum and here's five, here's four, Here's three, and here's two. So it looks like he's had a three, four, five laminectomy. A lot of scar tissue. I'm gonna have to start taking some of that scar tissue out so I can figure out what's going on. In. Just gonna, a lot of it's all scar tissue. You guys see that, huh? There's no bone yet. Next question. Next question comes from Oz on YouTube. Yep. They asked, uh, do you have to do epidurals or facet injections before a spine surgery, or is that myths pushed by pain management doctors? Yeah, so Oz, 
all the epidurals and stuff that you hear about before spine surgery, it's all pushed by the pain management doctors because that's how they make money. No, epidurals don't work, okay? They, they may take your pain away temporarily, but you are gonna be back again for more treatment. Epidurals never fix anything. That's something we've learned over the years. You might feel better for a while, but they're not fixing anything. They're just making you feel better for a while. It's a matter of time before you're back again having another treatment for that back or neck. This is all scar tissue. You guys can see it, all scar tissue, totally abnormal from the prior surgery. The best thing to do is Duke Spine Institute has figured it out. Back pain comes from the disc 85% of the time, a disc problem. And the treatment, the best treatment is the Duke Laser Disc Repair. Back pain comes from facet joints. Okay, facet joints, 10% of the time, roughly. The best treatment for that is not an RFA. It's called a Duke Plasma Rhizotomy. We pioneered it and discovered it here. It's a, basically a permanent fix for the facet pain. So, between discogenic back pain and facetogenic pain, that's 95% of pain in your back. And we have the treatments that are minimally invasive and highly effective. Other doctors don't have those treatments. You're not gonna get them elsewhere. Not yet. Eventually, maybe they will. But if you wanna get rid of your back pain in a safe, responsible manner that actually works, you come to Duke Spine. Now understand something. There's 30 causes of back pain, but not all 30 are equal. Some of them are more common than others. For example, like I just told you, the disc is the most common. And after that, the facets. Now, understand, you've got 10 facets in your back. They're not all causing pain. So we gotta figure out which of those 10 facets are causing your pain. Or which of those five discs are causing your pain. And usually we can do that through an MRI, physical exam. All right, you see what I'm doing, Dr. Patel? For those of you interested in spine surgery in your future, uh, not getting it done, but becoming spine surgeons, it's very important when you're doing revision spine surgery, you find some normal structure, like up here and down here, and then you work between the normal structures, like I'm doing. And you wanna clean out as much scar tissue as you can until you can find normal bone. The key is to stay on top of the bone. If you can stay on top of the bone, you won't hurt the nerves. You won't get a spinal fluid leak, unless of course the other doctor has one, in which case you're probably destined to get it if you go anywhere near where he operated or she operated. So I'm getting close to being done with the exposure. This is the most delicate part. I'm right on top of the nerves and spinal cord, basically. And I'm trying to peel away just a little bit of this scar tissue so I can find the bone, so I can actually treat the patient. I gotta find the bone so I can remove it because it's these bones and ligaments that are pinching on his nerves. from the back. Suck. Uh, everything good, Burn Desk? Thank you. Yeah, we're doing good here. All right. Man. Mm-mm. This side seems like because it's flipped up towards us and the scoliosis is going to be easier. And what I'm looking for right now is the edge of the bone. Remember, the other surgeon came in and did a laminectomy, supposedly. So I've got to find the edge of that bone. Where they cut. This is why no other surgeon wants to do these revision surgeries, because they are extremely tedious and risky for the patient. 
wipe tip. Great job, guys, on the assistance here. Dr. Patel, thank you. This is ligamentum flavum right here. Any questions? Yes, our next question comes from Oz on YouTube. Bobby. Yes, Oz. They ask, can uh, hypertrophy fa uh, facets lead to effusion? Can hypertrophy facets lead to effusion? Great question. Like, can the body automatically fuse? Probably not, but will you need effusion? No, if you have hypertrophy facets and you're having back pain from them, come and get the Duke Plasma Rhizotomy. You don't need effusion. Now, if you go elsewhere, the surgeons will give you effusion. That's because they don't know how to do the more advanced techniques. Again, you gotta understand something. The most advanced spine surgery is only done in a couple of places in the world. Even though there's thousands of spine centers, only a few of us do the most advanced treatments. What are you worried about? That's gonna be your lamina right there. Your pars, inner articularis. See one facet, the other facet. This is the pars. We're gonna literally cut through that with the saw. So I'm not sure what the question is, but if you have hypertrophy facets and you've got back pain from your facets, you want the Duke Plasma Rhizotomy. You don't want a fusion. We have a few more questions. Yeah, I'm going to take all of them. This next one comes from Tino on YouTube. Man. Yes, Tino. They nice to meet you. They ask, would this patient be a good candidate for a 360 D lift? A 360 what? D lift. D lift. Um, uh, I'm not really sure. I, I don't think, maybe you don't understand. This is the very best surgery for the patient that we can do from a fusion standpoint. If the other surgery, the D-Lif, was better for him, we'd be doing it. So I don't know how to answer that question. That would be like saying, this guy's hungry. We can cook him up the best steak in the world, or we can give him a hamburger. The best steak in the world is what we're doing. Would a hamburger be OK? Sure, I guess. But why would you want to have a hamburger if you can have steak? So the D-Lift procedure would be worse than what he's getting now. But I suppose he could get that too. There's lots of things these patients could get. I mean, but why would they? Why, why not do the best? That's what we're doing, the best surgery, the best type of fusion. This is the best type of fusion in the world. There is no better fusion than this. Sure, there's lots of you know marketing and nonsense out there, but there's no fusion I can't do. And we choose this fusion because this is the safest and the most effective fusion in the world available. This patient's going to go home, by the way, today. There's no hospital stay. This is outpatient, the way we do it here. That's how atraumatic it is. By the way, I'm sliding along the, la the uh, lamina. There's the pars inner articularis down there. Very, very hard because of all the scar. This is all scar tissue I'm playing with. Normally, this would all be exposed by now. We'd be done. So it looks like the surgeon before never really took the lamina off. They just did the spinous processes. Because I'm feeling bone all the way across the back here. It's too early to say that 100%, but that's what it's looking like to me. Bobby? Let's see if we can find an edge here. A lot of these spine surgeons, they do what we call it. There's an edge. We, we call a shamanectomy, which is a sham, laminectomy. And the patients don't get any better. But the surgeon gets the bill, make money. Patient suffers through a surgery that doesn't really work or fix their problem. 
we see it often over the years. A lot of bad, bad spine surgery. Of course, the surgeon will never tell the patient they did a bad spine surgery. The patient just wonders why they don't, their pain doesn't go away. Such a complicated world out there. I don't envy the patients, I really don't. They're, they're being lied to left and right. All right, any other questions? Let's see the Lexo. Yes, next question comes from Darren once more on Facebook. Yeah, Darren. Th they asked, if a patient has an autoimmune disease, will that potentially cause the DLDR to fail? Yeah, so if a patient has an autoimmune disease, would that cause the DLDR to potentially fail? Autoimmune diseases would cause every other surgery to fail worse than they would ever cause the DLDR to fail. So the DLDR is still the best option, even with autoimmune disease. And the good news is we've actually had some patients with autoimmune diseases that, um, that had the DLDR, right? Even collagen vascular diseases. So the DLDR works in patients with collagen vascular disease, hello, hello, and autoimmune diseases. So, nope, no problem there. DLDR is still the best option. Our next question comes from Tino, once more on YouTube. Hi, Tino, welcome. They asked, does uh, insurance cover the laser spine procedure? Does insurance cover the Duke laser disc repair? We expect it to, unless you have Medicare. Medicare will not cover it. Medicaid, no. Um, there are certain insurances that probably won't, but most commercial insurances should. They may not want to cover it, but you know, we can be very persuasive at getting them to cover it. Depends on your insurance. Just like with all procedures, not all insurances cover all treatments, right? I mean, tell me one insurance that covers everything. I don't know. Shoot, I have United Healthcare, and my wife just had surgery done, and we had to pay $14,000 out of pocket, and they supposedly covered the surgery. So I don't know. What does cover mean anymore? Anybody have an answer for me? What does cover mean? You know, United, my wife went to the doctor and the doctor charged $250. Their United Healthcare covered the office visit. My wife paid, uh, I want to say, I think it was $90. $90. And United Healthcare paid four dollars and fifty cents. So, did they cover that? I can't tell. If my wife paid ninety dollars, and the United Healthcare paid four dollars and fifty cents, did they cover it? I can't tell. So, I don't know what cover means anymore. It's a, just a, a lie. And I'm going to tell you who's at fault here. It's you, people, out there. You're at fault because you let your insurance companies get away with not covering whatever it is they're covering or not covering, you guys let it happen. Me too, I guess, I'm a beneficiary as well, so. The way you get insurance companies to cover medical treatment is you hold your politicians responsible, accountable. You see, it's state laws that let the insurance companies not pay for your medical care. So if your insurance doesn't cover something, it's because your state politician wrote a law that basically let the insurance company get out of paying, straight cure it. It has nothing to do with the doctor or the hospital. It has to do with the insurance companies are always trying to get out of paying for everything. Shoot, if insurance companies could, they'd pay for nothing. And that's actually what it looks like they're doing nowadays when my wife is paying 90 bucks and they're paying $4 for an office visit. They're basically paying nothing. And who allowed that? You did. So, if you wanna get angry with anybody, get angry with yourself. Don't come crying to me. Does insurance cover it? I don't know. 
You should. You figure that out. It's your insurance. Sorry. I'm not callous or anything, but I'm just being a realist. People want to blame doctors when their insurance doesn't cover something that's good for them. Blame yourself. Blame your insurance company. Don't blame the guys, the doctors that are actually providing good care. That's just the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But I hear it a lot. Angle Curet. I'm so sorry I came up with a solution for you, but it's not covered by your insurance. My God, flog me. <laughs> uh, right, Dr. Patel? Yeah, doctors have been, have been asked to, to be feel guilty about providing treatment that your insurance doesn't cover. But no, I'm not going to feel guilty about it. I'm going to be proud of the fact that I provide the best care for my patients. If their insurance doesn't cover it, that's their fault. You go fight your insurance. You're the one who bought the insurance. You're the one who believes your insurance is so great. Sorry, your insurance is not great. Your insurance is, is literally robbing you blind, and they have been for years, and they're going to continue to do it as long as you guys keep blaming the wrong people. They're going to keep doing it. Why not? They're laughing at you right now, Woody. They're literally laughing at you, the patient, because you guys fight your doctors and hate your doctors because they offer you treatments that work that quote unquote aren't covered. And they're laughing all the way to the bank. All right, so we've got really thin dura right here. You guys can see that? All scarred up from prior surgery. Really thin. So this is gonna be very challenging. All right, let me have an angle curette. Yes, I need a woody and an angle curette. Yes, so I've got to literally peel this dura off the uh, bottom of the lamina here, hopefully keeping it intact. Now when I t typically will see this, this much scarring of the nerve sac to the bottom of the lamina, you have a, uh, a smaller angle or is this it? What it typically means is that there's been a spinal fluid leak in the past. In other words, the other surgeons, they may have suck, they may have actually gotten into a spinal fluid leak, and that may be why they didn't complete the surgery and then do the laminectomy properly, because they, they wanted to get the hell out of there while they could. That's made my job massively difficult. You guys are getting a special treat, getting to see this case. This isn't just a simple four-level laminectomy infusion. This is an incredibly complex case with revision surgery. You get to see me use my best skills and techniques to try to help this patient. All right, Lexo. Questions? Yes, next question comes from Darren once more on Facebook. They asked, if you do a laser procedure on a disc in the lumbar and a different disc in the thoracic, is that considered two operations? Great question. Well, the answer is no. If I do those two procedures at the same time, it's one operation. Okay. One operation. And if, am I able to do that? Absolutely. Angle curette. Can you guys see this here? This is the dura. And it is very abnormal, totally scarred down to the bottom of the lamina, making this incredibly difficult. This is as hard as it gets, folks, honestly. I'm only telling you that so you can understand that this is a very, very difficult surgery to do. And I knew what I was getting myself into. I'm not trying to say anything other than that. It's just normally you're not doing micro dissection techniques in a lumbar spine. But I have to do this because I got to get these abnormal facets out of here because they're contributing to the scoliosis. And I don't want this patient, straight curette? I don't want this patient to, 
I want to give this patient the best result humanly possible. And to do that, I have to correct some of the scoliosis while I'm here. And the way to do that is to get rid of these abnormal facet joints. Now, fortunately, this technique I'm using is only going to be needed in a small part of the spine where the surgery was previously done. But it's, you can see how hard it is. I'm literally scraping the dura off of the bottom of the lamina where it's scarred to from the prior surgery. Woody, angle curette. And I'm using straight curettes and angle curettes to do that. You start with a straight and then you move to an angle once you get it started. And some people think using a smaller curette is better, it's not. Smaller curettes have a higher chance of having complications. Okay. So a bigger curette is actually better. It's kind of contrary to what you would think. And you're gonna see how scarred this is. K5, starting to make some progress. This is L4, by the way, I think, no. Uh, it's hard to tell, it's so messed up in here. Now these pieces of bone I'm giving my staff, we're gonna try to save them. I'm going through the pars interarticularis right now. I'm gonna do an osteotomy in a moment. I need to take down a little bit more of the scar tissue. I'm kind of letting you know everything I'm thinking about as I'm doing it so you can get into the mind of the spine surgeon, so to speak. Questions? Next question comes from Darren once more on Facebook. Ask. Uh, straight curette. Asking, correcting a scoliosis may still leave the patient in pain if their discs are not repaired, correct? Yeah, you're correct, Darren. Correct, 100%. Yep. Yeah. Why am I correcting the scoliosis here? Because I've got to fuse this patient, right? I've got to fuse four discs. That's a huge fusion. And if I don't correct the scoliosis right now, I'm basically committing this patient to having scoliosis the rest of his life. Because once you fuse in scoliosis, it stays in scoliosis, bogey. And, and I, that's not something I would ever wanna do to anybody. That's just bad spine surgery. You never wanna fuse somebody in scoliosis if you can avoid it. And that's, you know, that's why I'm trying to clean up these facets. There's two reasons I need to remove these facets. Straight. Number one, they're definitely pinching the nerves and nerve roots in the foramen and they're contributing to his leg symptoms. That's only gonna get worse when he wakes up from surgery because um, we've got him in lordosis, right? With the bed and that lordosis is perfect for alignment purposes, for like alignment going forward to correct his coronal alignment. But um, it's also gonna put pressure on the nerves. Look at the scar tissue. Can you guys see that? Right there, you guys can see that, I hope. Holy Yes, mess. we can. That's bad. That actually looks like a dural defect and it wasn't even where I was working. So that's below where I was working. That may be from the prior surgery. That's what I'm thinking. And I will tell you spine surgeons out there that are watching that there is one nice thing about having a scarred up dura and that is it's harder to, to penetrate it. It's easier to, it's more resilient, more tough. I guess you could say it's a tougher. Dura means tough. Dura mater is tough mother. This is dura mater, tough mother, protecting the nerves. And by having the scar tissue, it just protects it even more. This is an angry tough mother, right? A pissed off, this is a dura dura mater, angle curette. A tough, tough mother, extra tough, tough squared. I realize now what we're missing, music. 
We used to listen to music when we did these long surgeries. We used to listen to, well, Luis will remember. One of my favorite soundtracks, you remember? Jesus Christ Superstar. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. At the end. Yeah, as we we're making some progress. This bone is pretty good. That's one good thing he's got going for him. The bone is hard. Uh -huh. All right. So we're making progress. Very tight. Very tight. My God, tight trying to go out the foramen. Look at that. It's so tight. Okay. Oh. Toby. Yeah. This is a lot harder than I actually expected it to be. All right, we'll get it done. So this has got to be L5 right here. And this is L4, and L4 has slid down. I don't know if you guys can see this. This is the facet of L4 right here. It's literally slid down onto the lamina of L5 and created a fake joint right here. So, and then that would be three here. Let's see this, All right? Three. Everything good, Dr. Berndez? By the way, the the amount of, uh, you know, chemical paralysis is perfect. Thank you. Doing such a good job. All right, any more questions? Yes, next question comes from Darren once more on Facebook. I'm right over the pars in articularis at L3 on the right side. They asked, how has medical insurance changed over time when it comes to surgery? How has medical insurance changed over time when it comes to surgery? They've, they're covering less and less, up here. Less and less surgery. When I started um, as a neurosurgeon on my own, 2004, the insurance companies didn't mess with sur neurosurgeons about spine surgery at all. Like if you felt the patient would benefit, you did the surgery. There was no blocking the surgery. Now, Fast forward, how many years is that? 20 years? Now they try to block every single surgery and it, it didn't happen overnight, it's been gradual. So it's just getting worse and worse for patients and doctors and hospitals. And the insurance companies are greedy, they're just keeping the money. They're just profit, you know? They're not reducing the premiums. Oh, by the way, we're cutting through the pars. This is called a Smith-Peterson osteotomy, for those of you wondering. It's got really hard bone. Man, forgot what a pain these surgeries are to do. Maybe I should have said no. So, yeah, the insurance companies are, are disgusting. They're stealing everyone's money, and they're... Um, basically taking your money and not giving you the medical care you guys deserve and that we've been doing for years. You know, they're calling everything experimental just so they don't have to pay. See, they, they pass laws that say if it's experimental, they don't have to pay. So they call everything experimental now, even when it's not, so they don't have to pay. And the only way to get them to pay is to fight them in court and force them to prove that it's experimental. Hmm. All right. Let me see here. Let's have the drill. So I'm cutting through the pars in articularis. This is right L4. The pars is located just above the facet, just below the pedicle, just above the foramen.
Now look at that facet, okay? I literally have to dig it out. You hear that cracking? Yeah. That is that is stuck yeah. to the other facet. And look at all the scar tissue from years of inflammation. So it's enlarged. You got bone spurs right here. And it's stuck. So there was no way that I could ever possibly, let's cut the other side out too, that I could ever possibly uh, move this spine back into good alignment without removing that facet. It was never going to shift back into good alignment. You guys understand what I'm saying? How you doing over there on electrophysiological monitoring? All right, thanks. It will be quiet since we're, you know, we've got muscle relaxer on board. SSCPs look good. All right, great question so far. I'm surprised we have people watching. It's such a, a gruesome surgery. Hey, what do you think, Henry? You think, Drew, you think uh, YouTube is going to age restrict this video? Most likely. <laughs> By the way, if any of our viewers can help us out, we'd love some advice. We constantly get some service doing copyright claims on our material, even though there is no copyright violation. And we're having to constantly send YouTube like emails saying, hey, we have the license and there's no copyright here. It's just a pain in the ass, to be honest. All right, look at this facet. This is pretty cool, guys. So since we're on the topic of facet joints that are abnormal, this whole ridge here is abnormal. It's all a big, feel that, Dr. Patel. It's all bone spur. Yeah, totally abnormal. All right, Woody, K5. Oh, man. So this is all in the area of the prior laminectomy. I'm actually going out the foramen right there. This is called the lateral recess, Harrison 4. This is where the nerve is getting severely pinched right here. Okay, and I'm one of the few people in the world that know how to do this procedure to unpinch the nerve. Most spine surgeons wouldn't come close to this. They don't know how to do this. Harrison 3. This is actually hypertrophy of the, of the superior articular process of L5 right there. And it's growing medially towards me. And that's what I'm biting off. Luis, we got a problem here. K3 is sticking. I need a new suck. I need another K3. I would lubricate it. So what I do here, for those of you interested, and I've published this, is I literally bite to the pedicle. The pedicle is going to be right around here. So I'm biting off all this overgrown superior facet, which is compressing the nerve root in the lateral recess. This is the number one reason that people get drill, that people get um, stenosis, spinal stenosis that's actually significant. It's called lateral recess stenosis. And nobody talks about it. No one really understands it. Actually, let me have the bovie. But I've been dealing with this for many years. The nice thing is the Duke Laser Disc Repair addresses it because you're kind of coming from the lateral side, the outside, and you get right into that foramen and lateral recess area with the laser. So I'm literally going to lop off this abnormally enlarged L5 yep. facet. Take that, Bobby. Tuck, tuck. There's always a little blood vessel, just lateral. Don't get your panties in a bunch when you see it bleed. Just go at it, paint it. 
like I did, large bite, and you're done. And there it is. So I'm going to take this superior facet of L5 that's digging into the foramen, and I'm going to chop it off, amputate it, drill. Okay, it's so tight here. And the reason it's tight is because the guy is laying on his belly. You ever notice people with bad stenosis? They literally have this posture where they're bent forward, like they walk like leaning forward. That's because they're putting their spine in kyphosis. They don't want to pinch the nerve in the lateral recess and the foramen. So they're, they have what's called neurogenic claudication. And you see this tip right here is literally sticking in. Drill. It's sticking into the foramen, digging on the nerve. And that's happening at most of the levels. And this technique I'm showing you is something that literally 99.9% .9 of spine surgeons don't know how to do. They're, they're completely lost. They wouldn't even dream of doing this, Kerrison. But that's why our fusion patients do so well. That's too big. And I think, well, man, man, there it is. Oh, almost, Kerrison 4. Man, I'm getting a headache from this head contraption. It's too heavy. I'm not used to it. There it is. Look at this, guys. This is great. Oh, yeah. All right, so this is the tip of the superior articular process of L5. And look at all this is extra bone, bone spurs. And it literally is digging in to the foramen. Lexo. Okay, I'm going to show you in a minute. So, ah, you got the bleeding again, Bodhi. Keep that. Don't, don't get rid of it. Bipolar now. We'll use the bipolar. It's safer to use in the foramen. It's not really safe to use the bovi in the foramen because you might actually accidentally bovi the nerve root, which would suck. Remember, Bovi sends the electrical signal throughout your body. Looking for the grounding pad. Well, the grounding pad's on the thigh, so that electrical charge is gonna travel. All right, there's the dorsal root right there, by the way. The dorsal ramus coming off the, the nerve root. All right. Bleeding is stopped. Typically, we'll put some gel foam. But the whole foramen is now decompressed. There's the nerve root right there. You guys see that? I'm literally grabbing it. That's the nerve root. OK, pretty cool. So we're going to put some gel foam and thrombin and just let it sit in there. Now, let me show you that tip of bone that I gave you. Give me that bone back, please, so I can show the audience and teach them a little bit. Sucky, sucky. Good. Take, take. All right, check it out. No, this is the facet. I want the tip that I just gave him. I told him to keep it and give it back to me. Oh, my God. Oscar, when I tell you to do something, just do it. Here it is. This is it. All right, so check it out. This was attached here, superior articular process. All of this is extra bone, shouldn't even be here. All right, bone spurs, all of it. And it was literally digging up, hitting the nerve root, which was right there, every time the patient stands up straight. That's why people with spinal stenosis from the foramen, they don't stand up straight. Totally fixable, but there's only about 1% of spine surgeons that know how to fix it. Kerrison Fox, I'm one of them. And I actually published this technique almost 10 years ago now. I've done a 1,000 of these surgeries, if you're watching. So we're pretty darn good at it. But don't expect your spine surgeon to know how to do it because they won't. It, take, it took special training and a lot of practice to learn this technique and develop it and perfect it. But unfortunately, 99% of spine surgeons don't know how to do it. All right. Um, we'll take some more questions. Let me have a straight curette. We've got to take out this hypertrophy facet. Just to give you a good idea, this is again the left, this is the patient's left side 
superior reticular process, L5. Now, the normal facet ends right here. You guys see this? Yes, we do. All of this medial to that is hypertrophy. It shouldn't be there. Let me have a kerosene two or three. Let me have a three. So I got to bite all this off because it's literally crushing the nerve root in the lateral recess. So I'm going to bite it medially till I get to the pedicle. Come on, come on, wait. Luis. Never mind. You got it, finally. When I put it here, it means you got to wipe it, right? It's not going to wipe itself. Question. This next question comes from Darren once more on Facebook, asking, are you gauging the depth, the depth of your drilling? Yeah, I am gauging the depth of my drilling. I know it, to a lot of you guys, it looks like it's not that difficult to do what we do, but every single maneuver we do is gauged as a neurosurgeon. Not just me, but all neurosurgeons. The movements you see are they may seem fast or clumsy or whatever, but they're highly calculated. And, you know, it takes seven years for a neurosurgeon to get through their training. And during those seven years, you, you know, most people work 40 hours a week. We're working 110 hours a week. So we're doing not seven years worth of training. We're actually really doing three times seven, 21 years. So in 21 years of apprenticeship, doing very, very fine surgeries and treatments, you can imagine the level of skill most neurosurgeons have. So yeah, I'm, I'm not just gauging the depth with my eyes, I'm feeling the tool. That drill you saw me use, I can feel the tip. I can feel a cut through bone. I can feel cut through diploic bone, cortical bone, kerosene fork. I can feel everything about it. It's like an extension of your finger t to me, okay, after using it for so long. I still remember the first time I used the drill. It was to drill a hole in someone's skull to take a bleed, a blood clot out. That one was, wasn't as bad. And that was in 90, 1997. I got to see here. Help me here. Hold this back. See the scar tissue? and. The hypertrophy uh, facet capsule. All right, pituitary. Beautiful. Well, we're making progress, and I hope you enjoy the view because it's given me a headache. Kerosene and fine. I'm not used to the weight of this contraption being on my head. I haven't worn it in years, really. I mean. All right, well that foramen is wide open now. Yeah. And again, you can see the nerve root down there. Huh? Let me have the kerosene five again. Might be able to get a little more. Ah, let me in, please. That's, look at all that ligamentum flavum right there. Okay, kerosene three. It's literally stuck to the dura. I got to see right here. Now, if I can get this out, great. If I can't, I'm not going to force it because it's literally on top of the nerve root. So I don't want to take that out. That would be a bad mistake. The nerve roots decompress. There's a little ligament. You can see the yellow stuff on top of the nerve root. But if I can't get separation, and the reason it's there, it's scarred. It's scarred to the nerve root. If I can't get the separation, I'm going to leave it alone because I don't want to damage the nerve root trying to get the ligament out. Are you seeing anything on EMG? No. I understand. All right, there's the nerve root there. Patel, suck it. Get that shit out of your sucker, please. Now. Now. That's the nerve root right there. Jofo? 
not having any bleeding, which is nice. Any other questions? No current question. Come on, Chris. Well, you guys are getting to see quite a view. By the way, if you like watching these open surgeries, we have plenty more you can watch. All right. Here's 5-1. Please don't hit my head. You get to go north or south, but not where, where I am. I think this is L5. Here we go. Let's get to the next level. I have to decide what to do at 5-1. Large bite. By the way, feel free to type up your questions if you have any. I'll do my best to answer them. Here's some decent bone right there. This is going to be your spinous process of three uh, and two, kind of the junction of the two. These cases are physically demanding. Let's see the drill. I'm getting a total headache from this headpiece. You may have to do something about it. Drill spins at about 70,000 revolutions per minute. Let's see a bovey. I'll give you an idea what the tip looks like in a second. It's going to be lamina right there. We want to cut through that. Both sides. Let's see if I can bite any more. I'll take the drill back in a minute. Yeah, his bone is hard. You guys hear that? Nice hard bone, which is good because that means his screws are going to hold nicely. All right, so here's the tip of the drill. It's a three millimeter bit, fluted on both sides. This is the most common bit used in neurosurgery. It's a, it's a neuro bit. Irrigation. This is the lamina I'm taking down that the other surgeon never bothered to remove properly. I need irrigation so I can see what I'm doing. You see the diploic bone? And then once I get down here, right here, you guys see that, Chuck? There's a window now, and that's the that's the fat right above the fecal sac and the and the ligamentum flavum. So we kind of jump back into doing these a fusion for you all in as big a way as possible with a four-level revision fusion which is the hardest there is to do. It's quite mentally and physically taxing. All right, let's see a kerosene. Well, hold on, let me just get a little more. I need you to suck. Suck here. I probably need a two. Two. Any more questions? Yes. Well, this question comes from Bill on Facebook. Uh -huh. They ask, is this a last resort type
type of surgery. I had the DLDR L3 through S1 in 2021, but my stenosis is gradually advancing. How do you gauge when T lift is needed? Afterwards, what is a typical recovery and how likely is the patient to suffer from adjacent segment disease? Yeah, so with, with the DLDR, we've not had to reoperate on anyone. So um, when people call me if they've had a DLDR and they're having symptoms, it's probably not coming from where we operated. I've never had a patient, uh, I need a kerosin, I mean, you know, it's, what was I last time? Okay, so what do you think I need? What comes after three? Four. Is this a four? So we've never had to operate on a patient with the DLDR where we actually did the surgery. And uh, we've been doing it for 16 years. So when people call me and said, I had the DLDR, I'm having some symptoms, guess what? 100% of the time, it's coming from something else other than where we operated, unless the patient injured that area again, which happens, but it's not often. So I'm not sure who the patient is, but if the patient's having symptoms, it's not coming from where we did the DLDR unless they did something and re-injured it. That something would have to be, I think, pretty substantial. Um, some type of a car accident or fall or heavy lifting and they, they would feel a pop, you know? People that re-herniate their disc, about 1% of our patients will re-herniate, one in 100, and they always tell me what they were doing. So if somebody's having symptoms, my advice is get a consult with me, figure out where the symptoms are really coming from, rather than assuming they're coming from stenosis. One of the things a lot of people don't understand is stenosis never causes back pain. That surprises some people. But stenosis causes weakness, numbness, and tingling in the leg. It doesn't cause back pain, ever. So if somebody is having back pain, it's not coming from their stenosis. Cracker. And to answer the question, would this surgery be sort of a, a, a last resort surgery, yes. Look at the overgrowth of the facet there. So this surgery would be for somebody who couldn't get the Duke Laser Disc Repair because the Duke Laser Disc Repair fixes the back pain and the leg symptoms the same as this surgery does, but without the open surgery. So um, before I would ever commit somebody to this kind of surgery, I would want to make sure they're not a candidate for the much less invasive, safer Duke Laser Disc Repair. This patient actually was, but he chose a fusion. Like I said, I don't force people to, to do what surgeries or treatments I want them to do. I, I somewhat let them choose as long as it's reasonable, I'll do it. If it's completely unreasonable, I won't do it. If I think it's a safety issue and it's not gonna work, I won't do it. All right, straight curette. So here's the next really abnormal facet. And you can see it's attached to the dura through scar tissue here. You guys see that? And I gotta free that up before I just rip it out. That's the bottom of the facet that's attached. Looks okay to me, large bank. Here we go, another abnormal facet. And look how the one below is growing over like a wave. That's not normal. So despite all this abnormal facet stuff going on, you still don't need to do this surgery because we're still able to get rid of the back pain and the leg symptoms with far less invasive treatments like the Duke Laser Disc Repair. About 10% of our Duke laser disc repair patients come back. They've got aches and pains somewhere else. They think it's, some of them think it's the same place, but it's not. 
and it just takes a good physical exam and sometimes we have to do a shot or two to figure it out <coughs> figure out where their pain's coming from but I've never seen it coming from the same disc we did surgery on that's for sure unless they've re-herniated all right the good, oh, the good news is damn the good news is that we are very close to being done with this hard part of the surgery. Let's see an angle curette. So again, the bottom of the facet here, this is the facet, is attached to the dura, Woody. And I want to make sure it's not attached, that it will actually damage the dura. So i got to see if I can free it up before I pop it out. Take that now. Huh? I need it. I need three hands right now. I've only got two. And remember, I'm scraping along the bottom of the bone. You have to feel the bone. You have to scrape along the bottom of the bone to stay safe. You got to feel it with your fingertips. If you're not on the bottom of the bone, when you use a curette like this, you'll be in the dura. You'll be dancing with the nerve roots, and that's bad. I can feel it. A lot of people are surprised to find just how much we can play with those nerve roots and the dura. It's actually more than you'd think. Let's see that cracker again. Yeah, bite. All right, beautiful. There goes another bad facet. So, this is kind of cool, Woody. Look at all the scar tissue on top of the nerves from the prior surgery. Now we're starting to get just at that place where the scar tissue's done. Suck over here, Dr. Patel. You can still see a few strands, but that's more normal for the dura right there. Okay, and then all of this is scar tissue from the prior surgery. All right, let me actually have the Woody again. How you holding up, Dr. Patel? I don't know about you, but I'm getting... Tired. See how the the inflammation here is stuck to the dura? We gotta separate that. Let me have a straight curette. <clears throat> well, if you're joining us for the surgery, you've picked a very difficult surgery to join us for, and this is as hard as it gets when it comes to the lumbar spine. It doesn't get any harder than this. But we're getting through it. All right, so when I get in this situation, what I like to do, I like to try to develop a plane between the facet bone and the, the nerves. Again, you gotta stay right on the bone or you're gonna get in trouble, okay? You gotta stay on that bone. And you can see all the scar tissue in my way. As long as you stay on the bone, you're good. All right, kerosene pie. Then I'll use a kerosene once I get a nice plane between the dura and the bone. I'll come in and remove the abnormal bone I want to get rid of. Just be careful not to grab the nerves. That would be a faux pas. Nice thing is, while I'm doing this, we're getting a nice lateral recess decompression medial to this facet. Again, you got to see and feel with your fingers scar tissue by the way you'll never see this surgery like this ever anywhere else in the world we're the first in the world to broadcast these live surgeries spine surgeries um, we started 10 years ago 
We're the first in the world to do multi-level fusions like this outpatient. Pituitary. These surgeries are done outpatient, meaning everybody goes home the same day. There's no hospital stay. There's no need for a hospital. We don't like hospitals. Hospitals are where people get infections. That's where people get complications. One of the reasons I left the hospital was because the hospital started to use, instead of medical doctors for anesthesia, they were using just nurses. And at first I was kind of open-minded about it. But then again, when my patients started to have complications from the anesthesia, and I, the nurses, no, Kerrison three, come on. The nurses were uh, not able to fix the problem. I decided it was time to move my surgeries outside the hospital because my patients were suffering with complications that I wasn't creating directly, but I was creating by bringing them to the hospital. That was the main impetus for me to leave the hospital and start my own surgery center at Duke Spine with Dr. Patel. We got tired of the hospital ignoring our concern about patient care. Can't entirely blame the hospitals because they, they have budgetary problems. We need a large bank. They can't afford necessarily to have all the nice medications we need and the equipment we want, the staff we want. They're always looking for ways to save money. And that just doesn't go along with my philosophy for patient care. I don't mind saving money, but when your quality of care for the patient goes down, that's not acceptable to me. I'm not going to have bad outcomes because the hospital is unwilling to spend the money on newer equipment. Let's see the drill. But anyway, like I said, you're joining us for as hard as it gets surgery, open back surgery, four level lumbar fusion. There's only a few doctors in the world that do multi-level like this. And I'm doing a Smith-Peterson osteotomies, inner body fusion, inner body cages, correction of deformity, stabilization, Bobby, and then large bite. So this is as big of a deformity correction surgery as you can get with stabilization, with fusion, and decompression. And I like to talk about the basics of spine surgery. There are three things spine surgeons do, keratin five. We decompress, get the pressure off the nerves, which is what we're doing. We correct alignment, put the spine back in its natural alignment bipolar, which is what we're doing with the osteotomies, inner body cages, correction of deformity. And then we stabilize the spine. So decompression, realignment, stabilization, three, three primary goals of all spine surgery. Now some people don't need correction of deformity. I can't see. Some people don't need stabilization. Some people just need a decompression. But most people need a stabilization and it doesn't have to be with fusion. Okay? Most people don't understand what stabilization means, gel foam. See, spinal instability was first described by White and Punjabi. Bobby, I'll show you a little Bobby trick. Using my Woody as a conduit. You like that? Huh? Just oh, can't yeah, touch the bo the dura. You don't need that. Yeah. But uh, a lot of times you can use a metal instrument to help direct some charge. All right, good. Um, White and Punjabi are, were a bunch of orthopedic surgeons, two orthopedic surgeons that they were spine surgeons, and they were the first to describe spinal instability, and if you go and look them up, and it's hard to find them, 
because the insurance companies have made them disappear. Angle curette. But basically, the true definition of spinal instability that has been accepted by spine surgeons worldwide is the presence of s extreme pain, severe pain, or neurological deficit, which is your weakness, numbness, or tingling from pinched nerves. Let me have a kerosene three that occurs with normal physiological loading of the spine. Normal physiological loading. What does that mean? It means everyday activities. You know, getting out of bed, brushing your teeth, washing dishes, normal loads. Doesn't mean going to the gym and lifting a thousand pound squats. It means normal loads. So if you're lifting normal loads and you're having excruciating back pain or neck pain, or you develop weakness, numbness, tingling, that is instability by definition. So how do you fix instability? Well, there's lots of different ways. But if you've eliminated the patient's pain in their back or neck, or if you've drill, gotten rid of their radicular symptoms down their leg, then you've treated their instability. You fixed it. And that's what the Duke Laser Disc Repair does. We get rid of the pain, we get rid of the neurological deficit without doing a fusion, without putting in a cage or an artificial disc or any of that nonsense that you guys don't need. So, we'll take some more questions. Next question comes from Darren once more on Facebook. Darren, nice. They asked, is the open surgery cost, is the open surgery cost effective for you when you could have completed several D DLDR cases in the same amount of time? Yeah, no it's not. No. Darren, you're right. We lose money on these surgeries, and honest to God, they're painful. Um, so they're not cost effective, but at the same time, this patient needs help, and I want to help them. So, you know, I'll be honest with you. We're not here for ourselves. We're here for our patients and to meet their needs, you know? I could have retired a long time ago. I, I have enough put away from 26 years. I'm sure Dr. Patel could retire a long time ago too, but we choose not to. We choose to help people. So it's not all about cost effectiveness. It's about doing what's right for the patient when we can. And um, this is one of those cases that I'm doing it because I want to fix this guy, and I know how to, and I'm not going to get fixed anywhere else because nobody else wants to touch him. Truth is, he's a <coughs> difficult surgery, and spine surgeons these days don't want to do difficult surgery. They want to do easy. So if I don't fix him, who's going to fix him? I mean, if this guy could go around the corner and get fixed, heck no, I wouldn't be doing the surgery. All right, I'm going to have to take my headgear off <coughs> because it's killing me. So um, let me just rescrub. We're going to take a minute. I'll need my go my gov and gown. I'll need the other headlight without this contraption. <coughs> Sorry, guys. I'm going to have to switch from the um, surgeon's view to the eye in the sky because I just can't take it. It's killing me, giving me a headache. for science, a man's got to know his limits. Take this. I'll be right over, help out.
That's thinking. That's what I like to see. Everybody thinking. Never give anyone else my two headlights when I'm in the operating room with a headlight. Don't lose those pieces, okay? I need to stay focused on a patient I'm operating on, not on this extraneous peripheral stuff happening. Luis, going forward, these two headlights are mine when I'm doing the surgeries, okay? I don't mind other people using them when I'm not here. All right, Henry, you back in the room? Where's Henry? All right. Mm. Where? No, I need Henry back in the conference room. Okay, that's been extremely painful. Let's see the Cobb and a bogey. No, this is not the right Cobb. Oh my God, look how wide these poster elements are. Here's the mammillary process. You see it? Let's go over here. We want the mammillary process again. There's the TP. Have a little too much muscle contraction. All right. Now, let me see that MRI. Uh-huh. Can you scroll the sagittal? Uh-huh. All right. And the other way, yeah. Five one's pretty bad. Let's go down to five one. I gotta see everything. Irrigation. Give me that. When I ask for irrigation and I don't have anything in my hand, you give it to me. Like so. We don't know where it belongs. Come here. So. Great. Thanks. An angle curette, Woody. Let me see. Um, That's got to be five one, S1 there. Let me see a bovey. Straight curette. Harrison four. All right, let's 
see the bovi? I may need a Lexo. Let's see the Lexo. That's got to be 5-1 right there. Hmm? Right? Lexo, thank you. That's sacrum. Man, crazy, huh? There's like no cars left. Karis, uh, let's see, Luxo. Uh, Karis in five. So we're just trying to work down at 5-1. There's the L5 facet. You can see the deployed phone right there. Like so. Plenty of time burn does so on terms of the anesthesia and the muscle relaxer. Yeah, thank you. So there it is. That's the gap between five and one. That's fine. We just need it for a little longer. This is just such a Incredibly difficult case. Uh huh. That, that feels. Raymond feels pretty good there. Let me see here. Large bite. Yeah, see the nerves stuck there? Harrison five. <sighs> well, again, more scar tissue, but this is the last of it. Let's have a Lexo. Thank you. And when I mean last of it, I mean last of it back here. Because there'll be more in the front. Uh, straight curette. Then angled. I'm just freeing up the nerve roots. Uh, let's see a large bite. Still sees the angle, a lot of scar tissue. Trying to get the nerves unstuck from the, the spine. Because the spine it, it has to be removed to put our cages in. The bony stuff has to be removed and we don't want to remove the nerves with it. Harrison Pye. Unroofing the foramen. That's the L5 nerve root right there. That patella is sucking over. It's going out the foramen. It feels pretty good. So we're going to do a cage at 4 5. 
We're going to do a cage at 3 4. Swipe. Come out of there for a second. Come out. You're just sucking up gel foam. And then 2 3. 5 4 3 2. 2 3. I think we should take this out too. Okay, Jofo, we're gonna take one last, do one last thymonectomy, osteotomy, and we'll be done. And then we can start putting our cages in, inner body graft. Large bite, don't suck. Here, take this. This is our last uh, decompression osteotomy, L2. The tool I'm using is called a Lexel Rongeur, developed by Lars Lexel, same man who pioneered radio surgery, a neurosurgeon, I believe. All right, nice. True. There's some good diploic bone in there we'll use. Sorry you guys can't see this that well, but I'm basically doing the same thing I did before, cutting out this abnormal bone in the back, basically a laminectomy, Smith-Peterson osteotomy. Oh, any questions? Suck here? Yes, we have a question from Darren once more on Facebook. Yes, Darren. They ask, would you hire a nurse uh, anesthetist? Would I? Yes. Uh, I don't know, it's a tough question, you know? I, I haven't a nurse, I haven't hired a nurse anesthetist. Um, if, I, if I talk to my anesthesiologist, so if there was a need, let's say there's a need, uh, I would always have a medical doctor anesthesiologist in charge of my anesthesia. And if that medical doctor anesthesiologist said, yes, let's hire this drill, nurse anesthetist, then I would, I would do it under their supervision. But I myself will not supervise a nurse, anesthetist. I don't believe in, in my opinion, compromising quality. Yeah, I'm going to upset some people I get, I get it, who are going to say nurses are just as good as doctors, but I don't believe that. Now, I do believe there are some nurses that are better than some doctors, for sure. And it's not common. But there are some really bad doctors out there. It doesn't mean the nurses are smarter or anything. It just means there are some nurses that, nurse anesthetists, they take their job really seriously. They, they're really good people. They care and they're smart. And they've done a great job to learn the trade. They're better than some of the anesthesiologists. Wouldn't you agree, Dr. Berndos? Yep. It's not many of them, but it certainly has happened. Now, every time I get my colonoscopy done, I get a, a nurse, anesthetist. That's what they give me, and I take it because I trust my surgeon. And my surgeon, my GI doctor, said they're very good, the one that they use, and that I can trust them. So I trust them. I trust my doctor, and I trust the choice he made. Um, but would I ever hire a nurse anesthetist to do my surgeries by themselves? No, I wouldn't. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I would not. Sorry. My mom's a nurse. My sister's a nurse. Woody, I love nurses. We have lots of them here. But, you know... I truly believe that there's a reason why anesthesiologists are, and medical doctors originally, you know? It's not an easy job. Oh, by the way, anesthesia can be easy like surgery, you know, like what I'm doing, right? But it's not the times that it's easy you worry about, K4. It's the times when it's hard, when you have a complication, when there's somebody dying and you wish to God you had the right doctor there to help stop them from dying. 
okay? It's just like surgery. You know, for the most part, it's easy. But then when you get into a complicated situation, that's when you draw upon your vast experience, knowledge base, and training. So I can't say that I would accept that situation willingly. Oh, wow. Look at the overgrowth of this facet. Can you guys see this piece of bone right here? That's hard. It's literally grown up and over like a wave cresting over a surfer who's riding a wave. Except that's not a surfer, that's a facet joint. That's an inferior articular facet. And I'm literally, it's just massive overgrowth of bone. Those are, those are bone spurs, folks. Hmm. Ma a mallet, just about done with the laminectomy, osteotomies. Look how stuck it is, right? You can't move that. So a lot of surgeons want to fix scoliosis by putting screws in and twisting the spine. You can't twist against that. That's why it doesn't work, and their screws get loose, and they fail with fusion. If you want to successfully get rid of curvature, you must remove the abnormal facets. That's what I've been doing for years, but a lot of surgeons don't do it because it's very hard to do. And it takes a lot of time, and you don't really get paid much for it at all, if you even get paid at all. But you get better results. All right. Woo! K5. Getting there. So we talked about the phases of this surgery. We talked about exposure. Um, you know, we talked about uh, the laminectomy for decompression which is done. We talked about, gosh, uh, the Smith-Peterson osteotomies, right? To derotate the spine, which we're, we've done, just about done. Actually, we've done. And now, in a few minutes, we're gonna move into the inner body cage, inner body fusion, because remember, this is a TILA. TILA stands for transforaminal lumbar inner body fusion. We're going to go to the inner body space, which is between the vertebral bodies, which are in front of the spine. We're going to get to the front of the spine through the back. That's what a telus all about. It's harder to do. It takes a very experienced spine surgeon to do it. Most spine surgeons don't know how to do it. When I was trained to do it, it was back in the late 90s when it first came out. I was trained by a top neurosurgeon from the Barrow in Phoenix and a few other spine surgeons like Rick Fessler. So it was a new technology just coming out back then. And since I went to a top neurosurgery training program, I was able to, to learn it there from my teachers, my faculty, the TLIF. But prior to that, a lot of spinal fusions in the lumbar spine were done anteriorly through what's called an A-lift, anterior lumbar body fusion, which is a very dangerous surgery. But that's how they do artificial discs, too. I don't recommend it. All right. Just about finished here. Another 10 minutes, and we'll be done with this. I need the cob. You see this? I put the woody down. The, the next thing I need is a cob. Uh-huh. Gonna look how posterior this superfacet of three is. Okay, that should be good. Nice job, Luis. Way to anticipate properly. Now, you're gonna find the transverse process right here. Okay, there it is. See that? TP guys, gals? Transverse process coming off the facet. That's the relationship. So when we're doing rhizotomies, we're aiming like right here. Right, Dr. Patel? Yeah. Right there, where the transverse process comes and connects to the superior facet, right where the pedicle is. That's where we're gonna put our screw. Okay, that's gonna be our uh, L3 pedicle screw. Our L2 screw is gonna go right here. That's why I'm exposing it. Let's have a skin knife. I wanna open this up a little bit, not so our audience can see, but so I can see. Questions? No current questions. Mm. Yeah. 
I don't know. Uh, by the way, sh that next patient's thinking about just doing the rhizotomy. That's what they want to do, which is fine with me. Um, I would say I need, I got, let's see, I got, don't suck on that. Another hour inner body. Ah. And then another hour to close with screws. I'd say we got two more hours. So we'll be done by 2.30. So you figure out when they should be here. Mm -hmm. This is a long ass case. All right, check it out. Let's get some irrigation. Since we're here and we're teaching, can you see this, Henry? Suck, suck. Yes, we can. All right, I'm gonna clean it up. I want you to appreciate the difference between Woody, look at this right here. This is nice dura, okay? There's a little bit of scar tissue on it, minimal. But look at this nightmare I had to work through. See this, this is why it took so long, it's crazy. This added an additional 50% more time to the surgery, dealing with the scar tissue and trying to free up the nerves to do the surgery safely. But now his nerves should be just about freed up. Let's see the woody woodpecker. I'm gonna check his foramen. Uh -huh. A little bit of ligament there, K5. K5 stands for kerosene five. This is a kerosene, it literally bites between its beak. Beautiful. Now we gotta do this side and we'll be done. Sorry about the view, I apologize. My, my neck could not take any more of that headset. It's not anything anybody here did, it's just me. Uh, no, it's not facet, it's muscle. And, and I was getting a headache from the band around my head so tight, like a tension headache. So I apologize, Dr. Duke is just getting old. But if you like the surgery, my gosh, I've done hundreds and hundreds of these broadcasted. You can watch them online on YouTube. And just go to our Duke Spine Institute YouTube channel. Thank you. Save that, please. Oh, you're so twisted. And look up uh, Lumbar Fusion or something like that. Right, Henry? There's a playlist. Go to the playlist and you'll see the uh, lumbar fusion one and we have our dancing patients too which is all of our fusion patients not all of them but some of them who had the fusion here ended up obviously leaving and dancing before they left so far we've had some really good questions from the audience Bobby we're just about done we're gonna start our inner body work that's where it gets real exciting. Any question? No current questions. Right, must be the TP right there, you see it? You guys see the transverse process right here? This white thing, just lateral to the pedicle. I gotta take that top off. Woody Woodpecker, true. So by doing this, I'm gonna be able to derotate his spine a little bit. My God, that's tight. I can't even fit it in there. Man, that's tight. Uh, should be able to go in. There it is. Go, go, go. No, no, no. Drew? All right, well, I'm gonna have to take this top of the superior facet out. Come on. Yep. Oh. Beautiful. There it is. All right, Lexo. Luis, you haven't lost your touch, man. What is it? You haven't lost your touch. You remember all the steps, huh? Oh, yeah. That's pretty good. All right, Woody Woodpecker. I may need a bipolar. 
Next, Woody Bipolar. <laughs> Bipolar Woody, how about that? That's a first. All right, so a little bit of bleeding in the foramen, just around the foramen. I'm gonna go in there. Is my bipolar on? Why does it buzz? I like it when it buzzes. And you guys have lowered it or muted it, but I think it's just lowered. Suck, suck. There's always bleeding here, folks, just, just around the foramen. Again, I'm using the bipolar because it's safer. You won't get the nerve root accidentally. You don't want to get the nerve root accidentally. That's a faux pas. You get the nerve root, not good. You don't want to have to tell the patient I accidentally got your nerve root. All right, we're just about done here. I need to see right here. Kerosene three. I'm going to clean this um, lateral recess up right here. See that? I'm going to get rid of, let's have a four. There's going to be a disc down here. That'll be your L2-3 disc. It's on, but the volume's down. Okay. The way I know it's on, because if the volume's off, there's a delay. Actually, there would be a delay in the performance. So anyway, it's not a, it's not an urgent matter, guys, so don't worry too much. There's the disc. So show me here, please. Show me, pull back on the door. Right here, There's there it is. There's a big disc herniation right there. All right, how am I gonna do this? I need to drill this down a little bit. And then I'll be able to bite it out. I was a little conservative here when I took this tip of the facet out. I wasn't sure where the pedicle started, so I kerosene irrigation and three. Kerosene three. That's just what do you think that is right there? Are you gonna freak out? Oh my god, the nerve root. Huh? What do you think that is? No, of course it doesn't look like. So I need to get in here. You got to move. Move your body. Twist it. That was what? Patel? Ligament. Ligament. Right? So when it comes to surgery, you got to know your anatomy. Everyone does. If you're going to be a surgeon, anatomy is a, t a class you take in medical school. And... If you want to do surgery, you better learn your anatomy. Anatomy is the most important, one of the most important classes to be a surgeon. Take, that's just epidural veins, right? I'm trying to bite down to the pedicle because that's where the disc is. We're going to have to take this disc out. Now this is one of the worst areas of scoliosis in this patient. So. L2-3, so I really want to get as much exposure as of the disc as I can. Woody, bipolar, sucker, here we go. I'm coming in, coming in hot. So I'm bipolaring the veins, which are bleeding, and they're right on top of the disc, okay? So no, notice where I'm at though. If you guys can see this, I'm very low in the foramen. I'm in Kambin's triangle. Scissor. I need you to retract and such. Bipolar. Dr. Pat come on. Dr. Patel is now retracting the nerve. And there's your disc. You guys see the disc? Henry, can you see it by any chance? You may not be able to. We see the edge of it. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, there's a huge herniation here. 15 blades. So I'm going to open the herniation up, take it out.
Do a Terry, small. That's garbage. All right, now I need a shaver, six. Don't suck too much of those nerves. Don't suck too much of those nerves. I mean, uh, blood vessels. Mallet, mallet. All right, so we're gonna introduce the rotating shaver into the disc space from the back. Is that a six? Yeah, that's a six. Ah, that's tight. <sighs> Are these the same shavers I'm used to using? Yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. They look a little yeah. different. That's a six, huh? That's a six. Let's go with a four first. Yes, sir. I don't want to fracture anything. Let's go with a four. You're doing great, Dr. Patel, by the way. Thank you very much. Come on, come on, come on, come on. No, don't put it, hand it like that. I can't take my eyes off my target. All right, any questions? No current questions. Great. You guys know everything. Small pituitary. Get quick, come on. You gotta move. You gotta move, buddy. That's too big. Is there a smaller pituitary? That's too big. All right, Kerrison three. Now is the rep here? That's yeah, too big. Yeah. Is that a three? What the fuck? That's a four. Three means three. Oh, Come that on. Was me. That was me. That was me. All right, guys. Get with the program. Watch it. All right, let me have a rotating six. Mallet. Uh, are you guys sure you have the right pituitary? Because that pituitary looks big. Let me see. All right, that's the right one. Thank you. Was that the same one as before? You sure? All right, this is good. That's a six. Pituitary? Sorry. If I'm bumping you, I don't mean to. You're doing great, Oscar. Thank you, Luis. You're doing great, too. I know this is, we don't do a lot of this stuff anymore, so, oops, sorry about that. Keep hitting you guys. All right, let me have the bipolar. I had a good talk with Rohan this morning. <sighs> I need to see south. It's too much. All right, I need that uh, kerosene four, please. Kerosene four. Yep. Protect the nerves. Man, that, that is still tight. I gotta see the bottom. Protect the nerves. There we go. Nice. All right, let's go with a six again, and then I may go to an eight. Yes, Guys, have the six and eight ready to go, okay? Yes, if I just use the six, I may use it again, If and then the next one up would be an eight. Let's go with an eight. You guys got to take it from me. Hey, protect. No, nope, you slipped up. You're above the nerve. Come north. You're under the annulus. There's a little bit of fecal sac there. Now, people ask me about the hammer. We use the hammer infusions, too. All right, what, what size cages do you have in terms of... I want the shortest cage you have. Okay, that's a 9 wide. Well, I don't mean... Uh, the height, what did I just do, an 8? No, the height is going to be a, I just did an 8, so I think we can get a 12 in here. 12 tall, but I want a short cage, front to back. Uh, narrowed is not so important, but sh short, front to back. All right, let's see a bipolar. Uh, sorry, Henry, we're not showing you guys anything here. 
You may want to zoom out a little bit if you want. Here. I don't know if that helps or wipe, 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 wipe. Mm -hmm. Harrison Four. Any questions? Yes, a uh, question from Darren once more on Facebook. All right, Darren, fire away. They asked, you said this case is harder than expected. Why? Oh, the amount of scar tissue. The amount of scar tissue. You guys got to wipe. We got to wipe. Yeah. Nice. The amount of scar tissue and the twisting of the spine making the anatomy abnormal. The fact that there's bone and things removed from the spine from the prior surgery. I need the pituitary normal size. Well, yeah, but I mean, not a virgin back is one thing, right? It's, it's okay if you don't have a virgin back. You have a microdiscectomy, it's easy. Let me have a rotating shaver again, eight. And then I'm gonna take the pituitary and then a rasp. Yeah, the eight's good. So a lot of things, the absence of normal bone to guide is the, the surgery makes, uh, and what's left there is the nerve roots are exposed. So you can damage them easily if you're not very careful. So scar tissue, which sticks everything together and makes it almost impossible to see what you're doing. Hammer. The twisting of a spine, the enlarged facets, the severe stenosis, that's there, severe, mallet. I'm scraping the cartilage off the end plate, if there is any. Mostly it's scar tissue. Good job, Louis. There's a lot of scar tissue in the disc. I need the big one, guys. The little one's not going to cut it. You have a ring here, at? Let me see the ring. I'm going to use a ring. That's too small. Give me a big ring. Thanks. Ring here, an interesting tool. It cuts on the and the inside edge of the ring, <laughs> and it, it's nice because it's a relatively safe tool. Pituitary, it's got that outer part of the ring that's nice, gentle curve, can't really hurt anything. But then the inside of the ring has a cutting edge that lets you shave out the disc. Don't use it that often. Good. I think we're good. Yeah, I'm gonna put some bone graft in. Now some autograft and then a cage. Nice job. Uh, yes. Sorry you guys are not able to see. That's enough? I apologize. It's just that we can't, I can't wear that thing anymore. It was hurting my head too much. All right, so the cage we're putting in the inner body space has markers, it's filled with bone and it's made out of peak. Mallet, I like peak. This is a 12? Yes? Wow. Yep, so it's in the disc space now. I'm gonna use an impactor to shove it in a little bit more, very carefully around the nerves. That's kind of a big impact. You give me a smaller impact. Mallet. So I'm going to use a smaller impactor, a little more finesse, and I'm going to hammer it forward. Beautiful. Now I've got that cage nice and deep in the disc space. We're done. Come on out. So we're going to put a little gel foam, and I've already seen some correction of the scoliosis with that cage going in. Probably about probably about five degrees of the scoliosis, maybe ten, five to ten. Thank you. Don't move it. Good. That's good. Let's go to the next one. So that was two, three. Bipolar. This next one's going to be harder. Suck, suck, and retract. 
Yep, right there. See the nerve root right there? That's all scar tissue. Scissor. Scissor. Now remember, I'm, I'm literally working just above the pedicle. Take that. See the nerve right there? You're going to have to get under that. We're working in the, what's called the axilla of the nerve root. Oh. Too much, too much retraction. Now this disc is severely collapsed. And right, let's see if I can find it. I'm actually having some trouble finding the actual disc because it's so collapsed. I need the, the uh, pen field. I may have to bring my fluoro in. Let's get the fluoro in. See if we can find this disc. That may be it. Let me have a mallet. Mallet, let's go. I think that's it. It's super collapsed. Let's see if that's it. Just come out. Let's get a fluoro. Irrigation, yep. When we're uh, moving away, I like to put a little irrigation. Table up, oh, my back. Don't look at me, please. Okay, so we've completed uh, one of the discs. We're moving on to the next one. We're just gonna check a quick picture. Yep, there it is, so we're in, you see that? It is so tight. Five, four, three, two. You can all see that, right? We're right inside the entrance to the disc. All right, table down, floor out. So that is the disc. It's just severely collapsed. All right, so for these discs, if I can get a cage, it's going to be your shortest. So what is your shortest? An eight? Yeah. Don't pack them until I'm sure I can get in. Let's see if I can even get in. There is a... A little silver lining to the case, by the way, for those of you watching, we track. Let me have your smallest rotating shaver. Is that a four? Three? Let me have a three. Okay, so the silver lining here is this patient has decent lordosis right now. So even if I can't get an inner body cage, he's gonna have a nice alignment because of the surgery we've done on this table. There's a three, it's in. It's in. You can see the bone shifting. We're not going to get that much correction here. It's not too much retraction. All right, I'll take the four next. Nice job, everybody. Keep it going. So this phase is called the inner body fusion, inner body uh, cage placement. And there's another thing we're doing. It's called derotation. So that's a four, right? Yes, let's go, let's try to get a six. Yes, Let me just look here real quick, hold on. Uh, 15 blade. Let's see if I can open up the annulus, but the, the disc is just so collapsed. Oh, look at that, huh? Amazing. How tight. Any questions? Yes. Next question comes from Darren. Once more on YouTube, uh -huh. uh, Facebook. That's a six. Oh my God! It's like trying to fit a two-pound salami in a one-pound bag. All right, we got it. So I'm going to do the eight tall. All right. If I can get this, hold on. Let me just see if I can flip it. It looks like I can. And we're getting some nice correction of deformity. I think I can get this. Give me one second, and then we'll pack that eight. Yeah, we got it. Yes, Darren, we'll take your question. Bipolar is next. The question is, does the MRI show scar tissue? Does the MRI sc show scar tissue? It can, but um, it's not that there's a lot of scar tissue. It's that the scar tissue is in the worst place possible. It's like strategic scar tissue. Kerosin 3. So the MRI doesn't show scar tissue that well, but it will show it. If you use contrast, you'll see it. But then you have to give the patient contrast. And why give a patient contrast just to see scar tissue? 
There's really no point. You know the patient has scar tissue. Now, is that the fecal sac? See a Woody. Or is that the PLL? That looks like the PLL. Kerosene 3. Yeah, thanks. No, good job. I'm going to check here and make sure that's not the um, fecal sac. I think that's the PLL, right? That, that's the posterior longitude. Oh, you guys can't see it. Sorry. Kerosene 3. Yep. And then I'm going to do a 4 next. Wipe, and then I'll take, yeah, okay, fine. I'm just opening the hole in the back here a little more so we can fit this cage in here. All right, so that looks good. Let me have the uh, pituitary small. I'm cleaning out the grunge scar tissue inside the disc. A lot of scar tissue from inflammation. I'm going to need that. Um, there's a piece of disc. I'm going to need the... Uh, you can send that to the pathologist as well. Here's another piece of disc. Let me have a kerosene four again. I'm gonna try to open this hole for the for the cage a little bit more inside the disc. And I have one more trick I can do. It's using my drill. Let's get the drill. The drill is a wonderful tool if you're really good with it. I'm gonna put it inside the disc and I'm gonna literally drill the bone spurs away that are blocking me from getting in. I've done this many times. You gotta know what you're doing. Don't try this at home, kids. All right, irrigation. You have a, I don't think we're gonna get a rasp in here, so forget the rasp, let's just put a little bone graft. An auto graft. Don't suck there. Uh-huh, good job. So it's the same sequence, in case you guys didn't notice. I do exactly the same thing at each disc. As a matter of fact, the technique for the surgery is pretty much the same every time I do it. And there's a reason. Let's go with some more allograft. Uh -huh. there, and by the way, this is allograft bone. It's, um, we call it bone extender. Watch where you are. We call it demineralized bone matrix. And basically, here we go. This is the cage I'm putting in. And this is bone, right? There's no ligament in there, right? Yes, sir. Bone All right. Here we go. Thank you. Good job, Oscar. Oh, boy, that's tight. Man, that was almost not going in. You guys see that? I had to whack that thing. We're in. My grandmother used to say, thanks God. And then we're gonna impact it a little further into the disc space with this guy. Done, done, gel foam. Move on to the next one. So we're just going down the line. Two, three, three, four. Next is four, five. Wow, look how the spine is starting to straighten out because of these cages. Okay, now this is, I'm not the person who discovered this using cages to distract the spine and bring about what's called bipolar ligamentaxis, which is a shifting of the alignment of the spine through manipulating the ligaments and bones using pressure, distracting forces. Scissor. But that's what we use. We use lim ligamentaxis. Now, the doctors that use screws to derotate the spine, they're just loosening their screws. They're increasing the likelihood of failure. So I was taught never use your screws to derotate the spine. Stay over the disc. Because you're just going to loosen your screws. And your screws are what's holding your spine together when you're done with the surgery. So a lot of doctors don't know that. Or maybe they don't care. I don't know. But I see him do it all the time, incorrectly. All right, looking good. We're in the foramen, left four or five now, 15 blade. Uh, how's blood pressure? We're starting to see some ooze. May have gone up a little on you. Pituitary. Okay, uh, let's go with a four, four flipper, and then we'll do a six after. 
I'm going to try to get into the disc space with a four millimeter rotating shaver. And there's a way I do this. You see that? It went nicely. If you force this and you try to force the direction of the shaver, you can go into the bone. You can cause damage. It, it's literally a feel. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's not bad, but we have just a little bit of ooze, so I wouldn't let it go any higher. Look at the movement. Can you guys see this? Yes, we can. Okay, so what am I doing? I'm opening the bones where, like, the disc used to be. The bones, when he was, like, born in 18 and all that, his bones were like this with a nice cushion. Then the disc collapsed, the bones collapsed. What I'm doing is I'm pushing them apart. And as I push them apart, you can see the spine derotate. It's unrotating. So we are fixing the scoliosis. And the only reason I can do that is I got rid of those facets. Remember those god-awful facet joints he had? They were just creating so much problems. So in a little bit. Now I don't advocate this surgery for everybody, but I used to. I used to do the surgery Kerosin 3 on everyone because, well, I didn't know how to do a laser surgery. But ever since I've been doing the laser surgery, I, I haven't needed to do this. I've been able to fix people's pain in their back with the laser surgery and the DPR, deep plasma rhizotomy. All right, toe in a little more, Dr. Toe. I need you to create a, a nice path. Oh, come on, wipe. How's our waveform? Stable? Huh? That's all, that's all I need to know. Thank you. Good job. What is that noise I'm hearing? I heard something over there. Is that just chatter? I'm sorry? I just heard something coming from over there. Was it a, on the phone or what's going on? We're good? All right. Sorry. Dr. Patel, I'm beating you up, man. I hope you don't hold it against me. All right, what is that, eight? Yeah, yeah. Woo, look at that. Look how much movement. Can you see that, Henry? Just yep. a little twist. Yes, we can. A little distraction. And boy, the spine is starting to move in places we want it. That was an eight. So let's do a, let's do a, ten, a 10, a 10 cage. 10 tall. Do the shorty. Ooh, look at all that disc material coming out. All right. Just about done with our inner body. So, for those of you watching, never seen this before. First of all, I'm sorry I say the word so, so much. But um, we are cleaning out what's left of the discs. And we are putting bone graft in there. Oh, my back is killing me. I need a rasp, not a rest, a rasp. I need a rest too. So just so you can see the rasp here, it's got a very angry surface. And what we do is we put it into the disc space and you wanna hammer it in so you don't accidentally shove it into the pelvis or the abdomen. And we wanna basically clean up the cartilage off the and scar tissue it's mostly scar tissue off the end plate which is the surface of the bone in there okay because you won't get a fusion if you don't do that if you just leave the scar tissue there you will leave the cartilage there you will not fuse those bones fusion requires fracturing the cortex fracturing and that's kind of what that device does fractures the surface and it scrapes off the soft tissue so you can get a fusion. Woo! I haven't done a four level fusion in a long time. Now I remember why. They're painful for everybody. Not just me. I mean everybody. How about you, Berndez? Which do you like better? BLDR or this? I wouldn't be surprised if you told me you like this surgery. By the way, Luz, I keep some water, saline on this, because they're getting a bit dry, and they may die. Burn, Des? 
But which is easier is from an anesthesia standpoint? This one, right? Well, the airway control. Right? Yeah. So you, this is like not as stressful for you. <laughs> right? That was. Exactly. This is the future of spine surgery today. And the reason is because who does four level decompression, reconstruction, osteotomy, fusions, outpatient with go home the same day? I'm the only one in the world that does this, literally. Yeah. We've been doing it for 10 years. Woo -ba. Done. I mean, sure, there's surgeons that do one levels and maybe two level, but four levels, unheard of. Open with osteotomies, deformity correction, segmental fixation, just doesn't happen. But we're, come out, come out. But the spine is looking straighter. It's definitely straighter. All right, that's it. We're not gonna put a cage here. Yeah, we're done. We're gonna put screws in. Huh? I think we've corrected probably 15 degrees, maybe 12, 15. It's not a huge amount, but they does not need a huge amount. All right, let's get this uh, screws and rods ready to go. Any questions? Yes, these next two questions come from Cobb. Derek. Cobb, where's the Cobb guys? Go ahead. These next two questions come from Darren on Facebook once more. Sure. First, first question is, would you agree that insurance companies are forcing surgeons to be more technicians versus scientists? Oh, 100%. Insurance companies are forcing surgeons to be more technicians than scientists, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the insurance companies will, will, they just don't pay. And then what is a doctor going to do? You know, you're going to just do nothing for your patient. So a lot of these surgeons will go with the flow and do what the insurance companies want them to do because they don't want to stir up trouble and they want to get paid. But in the end, all these surgeons should be standing up against the insurance companies saying you should not be deciding what this patient gets done we should and that has to happen if that doesn't happen patients are going to continue to suffer because insurance companies are always going to want cheaper 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 for them that means more money in their pockets have you ever seen a surgeon do a four level osteotomy 360 reconstruction, inner body cage, inner body graft, posterior fusion, segmental fixation, derotation, outpatient. Outpatient for levels? Definitely not. Never. Are you yeah, and I've been doing it 10 years. What? I don't know. We may not need to step up. Because this new fluoro has a lower um, center. Okay, we need to bring the fluoro south. I wouldn't do two step-ups yet, but you can go ahead and do one, do it if you want to, but I have a feeling that we're not going to raise the table as high. So at this point, we've done our exposure, which took a long time. We did our uh, osteotomy, laminectomy for decompression, removal of the abnormal facets, done our inner body cage, inner body graft. We've derotated the spine considerably. And now we're going to put in our segmental fixation, our screws and rods. That's good. Let's bring the fluoro down and let's take a look at C2. Okay, I guess we need to go up with the table. Sorry, Jordan, I should let you do this. You're better equipped. All right, let's see that. Yeah, it looks good. Looks good. All right, let's get C2 lined up. Zoom in, so bring this towards the patient. Further, 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 go, 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 all the way, all the way, all the way. All right, and then I think you're gonna need to go north a little, but let's see, shot. All right, that's pretty damn good. That's really nice, actually. That's a really good start. I love it. All right, do I need a step up? I would say no, I don't. This, this fluoro is definitely lower, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's, I love it, man. 
worth every penny we paid for it. Yeah. You see the shitty fluoros? Their, their arc is up here, like whatever the beam is up here. So you got to bring the whole table higher. So you're standing on two or three step ups. But these new generation, they're lowering, I don't know what you call it, the center axis, whatever. I don't know the technical term. All right, let's get started. There's a mammillary process on the transverse process right there. Shot, that should be perfect. It is. Now, I'm going to have to get, you know, he's still rotated up here. So you got to be really careful where you're going with this thing, you know? This is called the pedicle finder. And the reason I use Alpha Tech is because the rep is such a nice guy. Just kidding. The reason I use Alpha Tech is truly, I think they have the best equipment out there. Shot. I'm using the fluoro. Can you guys see that, Henry? Every time I say shot, jump over to the fluoro and you'll see the probe going in the pedicle. His pedicles are actually quite generous. And the key to doing this is a couple of things. Number one, you got to use lateral fluoro. You don't need AP fluoro because you can see the pedicles right there. But I like to do a little twist, just, just a degree or two, to keep it in the diploic channel. What I mean by that is you want this probe in the diploic channel of the pedicle because that's where your screw is supposed to be. All right, what is that? A six, five, what is that, a four? Where is the five? Which line is five? All right, where's my rep? Which, so do you have the gear shift over here? You have another one, another gear shift? Pedicle finder, pedicle finder. Is it sterile or not? All right, wait, before you do that, before you, I don't want you going over there. So there's a number, it says five here, right? There's a line above it, there's a line below it. Which one is the line for the five? The one above towards the tip? That's 40, so it's the line above the number, right? I don't need it. It's the line above the number. So in this case, it would be a four and a half. It would be four and a half, or 44, or 45 I mean. 45 millimeters. And let's do a 7.5. You have a 7.5, right? I do. So 7.545. That should be perfect. Yeah, I'll do a 6.5 tap. So I have a hole. Give me a 6.5 tap. This is a tap. It's 6.5 millimeter diameter. Anyway, the reason I like Alpha Tech, I, I honestly don't like the company at all. I've said this before. I don't get any money from them. I don't want any money or anything from them, but um, I just don't like the, the people running it because I've, I just think they're greedy, like all these implant companies, but I'm not making my own screws yet, so I gotta use somebody. And I've tried them all, Medtronic, Depew, Synthes, Nuvasiv, everybody, Globus. Tried them all, and honestly, I hate to say it, but these guys are the best, in my opinion. So that's why I use them. You can go look me up on the national database of surgeons. I'm probably the only surgeon that doesn't get any money from anybody because I don't believe in taking money from companies that sell products that, that would potentially influence my decision. And you'll look up most spine surgeons and you'll see they're all making millions of dollars from these companies taking basically kickbacks, which are disguised as consulting agreements or intellectual property development or teaching, whatever. It's part of my Spine Scams Exposed YouTube video series where I talk about it. Anyway, can you hear this? Listen to the little tweet, little twerp. Torch, twerp. You hear that, Henry? Yes, we do. I forgot what it's called. It's called chirping, okay? And we're not talking about Twitter here. That means that the screw is in the bone nice and tight. That's what every spine surgeon wants. Looks really good. Interesting. Thought the screw would be longer. What's the name of this system? Invictus. Huh? Invictus. Invictus. I love it. What a name. 
Invictus. <laughs> I feel like I should be wearing a gladiator outfit while I'm putting these screws in. Invictus. <laughs> right? With a bunch of Spartans in the room with me. How are we doing over there? That was left L2. Huh? Sure. That's fine. Yeah, I probed the pedicle. There's no breach. All right, we're going to do the next one. And we're going to go down the spine. So this is number two. There's the mammillary process right there. So shot. This is my least favorite part of the surgery, by the way. <laughs> Pedicle finder. Yeah, I feel it's one of the hardest parts because you're, you know, placing screws and you want to make sure it goes well for the patient. It takes a. It's one of those things that you you never get to see the whole shaft of the pedicle finder because. Well, it's buried. So I like to just let it find its way down the middle of the pedicle if it's possible. Shot. I may be bouncing against the bottom of the pedicle right there, so I'm going to re-aim north. And that's the place you don't want to breach is the bottom of the pedicle. That's where the nerve root is. So if you're going to breach anywhere, breach on the side. Breach in the front, no big deal. But breaching below the pedicle is a bad thing. All right, this is going to be um, a 50. Again, 7550. No, yeah, 7550. And let's have the tap, 65 tap. Any questions? I know there was at least another question out there. Right? Yes, these next two questions. We've got to reset this, guys. These next yeah. two questions come from Darren on Facebook. Luis, teach him how to reset it, please. Huh? Teach him how to reset it. He just handed me unreset. Shot, you understand? If you don't reset it, then when I twist it, it's, goes the, it's, it's loose. Shot. Sorry, go ahead. Just doing a tender teaching moment. This next uh, two questions for Darren Sanders. First that one being, funny. Um, do you use compression boots on your patients? Yes. Darren Sanders, we use compression boots, compression stockings. Yes, we do. We take deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism risk very seriously. Thank God I've never had a patient with a DVT or PE. I need a ball tip probe. But um, other doctors get them all the time. As a matter of fact, I was talking to my nurses. All right, I'm probing the pedicle. It feels great. And just so you know what I'm doing, guys, I'm sticking this in and moving it around. I'm feeling the diploic bone. There's no breach. Um, we've never had a patient with a DVT, PE. Never. Other doctors do because they don't take it seriously. They overlook it, but we definitely do. PE, DVT PE, which is deep venous thrombosis, PE, pulmonary embolism can kill people, they die, okay? And so that would be a horrible complication of this kind of surgery, but it's a high risk surgery for that problem because yeah, 20% Dr. Bernder says. And the reason is because the patient's laying here for so long and then when he goes home, he's going to be laying around in bed because he's going to be in pain. This is a painful damn surgery. All right, that was right two. Next is left three. Watch that. Yeah, shot. Perfect. Now the pedicle here is short. You guys see how short that pedicle is? Show them the short pedicle. From the back of the vertebral body to there, it's very short. This is a short pedicle. He was born with a short pedicle. But this is going in nice. 
Real nice. All right, this is a good time to ask questions if you have them. This next question comes from Darren on Facebook once more. They ask, what's the purpose of, sp of the spinous process? So 40, uh, 40, 45, 75, 45. 7545. What's the purpose of the spinous process? The spinous process purpose is to allow spine surgeons that are unscrupulous to remove some bone out of your spine and call it a laminectomy and get paid for it. Oh, no, sorry, that's not the right answer. Um, the purpose of the spinous process is for muscles to attach to your paraspinous muscles. Okay, they need something to attach to, your erector spinae, bending. to allow twisting and bending and extension, to allow you to move, basically. So your lamina and your spinous process, this is a left three screw, nothing. Your, can I have the screw, please? The purpose of the spinous process is biomechanical, okay? It's to allow muscles to attach so you can move. Shot. All right. Oh, you hear the chirping, guys? Listen. You hear that? Yes, we do. It's what every spine surgeon wants. There are screws to chirp. It's like an opera in the operating room. Oh, my. We are almost done, and I am almost done. Ah. <laughs> it's too bad I'm operating on my mom next. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's find this next screw. Shot. That looks pretty good a little higher than I'd want it to be. Let's see the large bite. I'm going to bring it down just a tad. Bernadette, how's our patient? Let me have the drill. I'm just going to make a hole. By the way, his pedicles are beautiful. They're short, but beautiful. And hey, can you guys document short pedicle, please? You know, because sometimes we go back and look at these things and I mean, I think the incidence of short or narrow pedicles in spinal fusions for my patients has been almost 100% over the years. That's going to be a nice research paper for someone. Someone whose name is Krishna Patel. I'm starting to feel whipped, man. Like I just played a basketball game. So 45, 7545. All right, Dr. Pitzel, you want to tap that? Tap it. You see the hole? Questions? Um, check your angulation. Look where it's supposed to be. You're aiming up a little, so aim, aim down. No current questions. You just need to raise your hand here. Shot? There we go. And let it go. Okay, great. So we're just doing number three on the right. I'm telling my physiological technician. And don't force it. Let it go where it wants because it's going to follow the diploic. And I think the diploic is more medial. That should be good. Keep going. How far in do you have to tap? You have to tap until you get into the vertebral body. That's enough. You're in the body. Okay, so take it out. And then, and then, yeah, oh no, reverse it, and now back it out. Thank you, Oscar, great job. Give me that, you take that, P probe it. You feel cortical bone all the way around? Mm -hmm. I mean diploic bone, not cortical, but diploic, yep, me too, beautiful. Go ahead, Dr. Patel, and keep your hand north and so you aim south it looks perfect and mostly just let it go let it follow the threads you've already created 
Don't bring your hand medial. Keep it lateral. Unless it wants to come medial. All right, any questions? Irrigation. We've lost about 100 cc's of blood. We've used a good amount of irrigation. I'm just keeping everything moist. You hear the chirping? Vicka, let me finish it. Yes, we do. And no current questions. Thank you. Next, you guys got to watch this stuff. Clean it up. Next is going to be left four. Let me see it really good. And shot. Oh, that's perfect. You guys can see the pedicle of four, Jordan, show us. Very nice. This pedicle is abnormal. All right, guys, so this is a uh, hypoplastic. Let me have a Lexo. So please document that, nurses. This is a, uh, so at, at L3, we had short pedicle. At L4, we have short pedicle and hypoplastic. And Hypoplastic is H-Y-P-O-P-L-A-S-T-I-C. -P -O -P -O it means narrow, very narrow. Abnormal, abnormally narrow. You guys can hear it, totally different. Very hard to get in. So these are the ones you have to worry about breaching. And Again, I use my little twisty technique to help stay in the, the plug space. It's very hard to get in. Thanks, Jordan. This is going to be a 5-5 five five screw, if anything. 5-5. Five five. Holy God. That's so tight. Wow, I'm gonna. I'm thinking. I'm just gonna put this barely in. Yeah, I mean a four-five tap is right. What is that? How is that? Thirty? Thir thir I can't even get it out. Ah. I can't even twist it so tight. So what? What's happening is the entire shaft of this pedicle. There's no. There's virtually no diploic bone. Okay. Thirty. Yeah, we don't need to go too deep. This is so super, super tight. So it's going to be a 5-5 five five screw. I actually need a 5-5 five five tap. Bring me a 5-5 five five tap, please. Because I'm not going to be able to under tap this. The bone is too hard. So basically, there's no diploic soft bone channel. It's all hard, hard, hard bone. And we call that hypoplastic, meaning the pedicle didn't form normally embryologically. Shot, finish it, Patel. Basically, when the spine was formed embryologically in the utero, in uterus, the, um, the bones here, the pedicle of L4, never formed enough diploic bone. It was all cortical bone. <sighs> Give me a workout. I gotta quit smoking. Oh, wait a second. I don't smoke. Come on, come on, come on. It's this, it's this, it's twist this. And back it up. Uh -huh. Don't wiggle it. Twist. You can't wiggle it, otherwise you crack the bone or loosen it. It's a nice instrument, by the way, Alpha Tech. Suck it. That's ah, perfect. There's no breach, so we're ready for the screw. I can tell you, interesting spine. Questions? No current questions. You want to make sure you keep it polyaxial. Next, I need the irrigation. Patel, you got to clean that sucker up, please. Not doing anything if you're clogged. Drill. All right. Now, sometimes when you get scoliosis, nice job, keep going. 
the pedicle on the opposite side that's hypoplastic, you'll actually have pretty good, um, pretty good marrow cavity. Sean? We'll see. Maybe too much to ask for. Very difficult. Sean? That feels pretty good. It's tight. Not as tight as the other side. Shot. This is going to be a, a yeah, six five forty five maybe. Let me just see. I may be outside the pedicle here. Before we do anything, I'm. You can load it. I, I don't know that I'm going to use it. What is it? Six five tap? No, it's supposed to be a five five tap. Fine now. Ball tip. I think I'm lateral to the pedicle. No, it's too late for the tap. I already used the 6.5. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not convinced. You're definitely not breached inferior or medial. If anything, it's lateral. And it's hard to tell because I feel this is close bone. I think I'm going to aim a little more medial, see if I can do that. Now, sometimes when you think you're too lateral on the pedicle, you can reach. Come on, you need a suck, please. No. It's forcing me lateral. There is no medial corridor. Shot? There's no medial corridor. Oh, that feels like, I don't know. I'm going to leave that screw out. I'm not confident that it's where it's supposed to be. We're going to abandon the right four. All right, moving on to left five. Let me know when you're ready, Jordan. Take a shot. It looks pretty good, huh? Dr. Patel. Pedicle finder. Shot. That looks really good right there. Again, narrow pedicle. Narrow isthmus. Jesus. Damn, that's tight. Hear that, Henry? How again, it's a situation where it's so tight. I need this screw, though. I would say um, 6540. 6540. So 5 5 tap. We're almost done with the screws. Then we're going to do the rods in a moment. Then we'll do our posterior bone graft. And we'll close. He will have a drain. He will go home today. And we'll take his drain tomorrow. Any questions? No current questions. So somebody asked earlier what makes this surgery so hard. It's Obviously, all the scar tissue. This is going to be a left five, left five screw. It's all the scar tissue. It's the fact the bones removed, the, the nerves are exposed, the dura is not normal, and there's severe stenosis. But also now, with the hardware going in, it's the pedicles. The pedicles are so abnormal. They're so short. By the way, L5 is going to be hypoplastic and short. 
both hypoplastic and short. So please add that short hypoplastic. Three more to go. Your side, irrigation, we're not doing that one. The one below, go to the one below. That's not the right one, it's this one. Like so. Shot. All right, it's too low. I need to see a little higher, Dr. Patel. So if I could just move this retractor, I need to see a little higher. I need you to help me see a little higher. Move your body. Wipe. Wipe. Take that. Shot. That looks better. Pedicle finder. Yep, that's exactly where I need to be. Quickly, pedicle finder, guys. What are you waiting for? No, that's the ball tip pro, pedicle finder. God damn it. Luis, get him. Oscar, wake up. You're doing so good. You know? It's already hard enough to do this surgery without you not handing me the right things. <sighs> okay, this looks a little ne inferior. That feels pretty good. We're sliding along the pedicle, inside of it, of course, into the vertebral body. I need suction. Uh-huh. Good. Show me that, good. It looks like a four and a half right now. Uh-huh, there it is. You can hear that diploic bone shot, I mean a cortical bone shot. That's it? I would say, let's go 35. Seven, uh, sorry, 6535, 6535. Tap. Yeah, when I say 65, it means you go 55, okay? You automatically grab that tap. Shot. I'm checking my alignment, looks good. The alignment is the direction your instrument's heading. Is it heading along the pedicle or is it going too far up, too far down? And this is perfect. Two more screws to go after this. I need a ball tip next. Put it in my hand. I need to see what I'm doing, thank you. That feels good. I don't feel a breach. Take. All right. Well, I hope you're enjoying the surgery so far. Can you move this, please? This is getting on my hand. Shot. Looking good. So we've got, after this right five, L5 pedicle screw, we're going to do two S1 pedicle screws. All right, take that. We're gonna do a left. Let's see, come south a little, Jordan, just a little bit. Just a small amount, and then let's see that. Watch your arm, Dr. Pill, watch your arm. Watch your right arm. Come south just a half an inch, or an inch. That's good, let's take a picture, that's, that's good. That's really good right there, that's beautiful. Lock it all down. And shot. That's perfect. Shot. Pedicle finder. 
strange. His bone is a little soft here uh, on the left side. Very strange. Shot. You wouldn't think with all the hard bone he's got, there would be some soft bone. Now that right there is hard. Maybe medium. That's going to be the surface of the facet. Anything on EMG? Hmm. That's my picture. Sh shoot it again. I'm just under that that end plate. Maybe one. I think I want to go a little lower. Mm. It's not horrible to be just under the end plate, but it's cutting a little close. Phew. Man, it's a workout. It's a workout for us guys who are out of shape. Shot. That's better. Yep, thank you. Mallet, got it. Any questions? Shot? No current questions. Right. Anything left us one? Huh? Now, in my experience, S1 screws are the ones that fail when they do fail. I need a blue towel. You got one? All right, what do we got, Patel? Can you tell? Um, five there. No, maybe a five. Five, five fifty. I would say a six five fifty sacral. So is your sacral screw different? Is it a favor angle? Shot. But you no, you have an S one screw, right? That's got a favorite angle. All right, that's fine. Just give me the the uh, a screw. A six five fifty. That is correct. Anything on EMG? Okay, we're just about done. We got five minutes left on the screws. Maybe 10, and then we're gonna put rods in. What are your pre-cut, pre-bent rods? You have 120? All right, that feels good. Shot. Go ahead, Patel. Finish that. So we get one more screw in. We're going to test the screws. Make sure none of them are too close to the nerve roots. We do that by stimulating them with electricity and ramping the amplitude of that current up. Make sure you stay polyaxial. Are you polyaxial? Hold on. You got to lift this and then unscrew it. Good? Is it polyaxial? No, you're not polyaxial. You sunk it too deep. Let me have that back. Yep. Don't put it down so deep that you lock the head in position. Okay? Drill. Last one. This is a, a beast of a surgery, by the way, for those of you watching, Sean. Last, huh? I know where he yells well. We've been using a lot of irrigation. I, you know how many of these surgeries I've done? A thousand. I can tell you what the EBL, I'm gonna say a hundred for so far. That's fine, you can say 50. But thank you. All right, this is going to be a shot. This is going to be a 40. Yeah. 
6540, I think. Maybe, let's see. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe a 45. 45, fine. 45. 6545. Mm. Tap. So here's uh, Sarah, who's the nurse here? Yeah. So remember, um, this, this is going to be short pedicle and hypoplastic pedicle, right, at the L5. Oops. And then we said L4, I think, too. Nothing on EMG? Ball tip? So I'm sounding the pedicle hole, and it's literally perfect. Can't be any better than that. And what makes it perfect is his bone. His bone is nice. Nice, nice. All right, table down, floor out. We're done with the screws. We're going to test them. Now, if you watch the surgery, you see I put screws in at every level, and we call that segmental. Dr. Patel, you want to test those screws? Segmental means every level or, or more than more than just the, the, the begin, the top and bottom. Some doctors, they used to put the screws in at the top and the bottom. And the problem is you get what's called snaking, which is when the construct, will the spine will snake between the fixation points. It's bad. You don't want that. So I learned during my training, you don't want to do that. You want to do multiple points of fixation. That's what we've done. Left L, sorry, hold on. Left L2. I think the rod's going to be a 100 or 110. Yep. Come on. Oh, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do something. But get out of my way. You gotta make some room for me. One ten. Good. One ten is perfect. We don't need to bend it. All I want to know is it breaks above 10. Right, L2. You can count the number out if you want. It's fine. Right, two. All right. Seven. Left L3. Wait, 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 wait. No, what do you mean? Le left three. You want to test right two again? Start right two again. Hmm. All right, we got to take that screw out. Screwdriver. It's interesting. Is this able to seat back on the screw? How do I re-engage? Oh, there it is. I need a ball tip probe. The seven is too low. Watch that screw, please. Uh huh. Are you seeing anything on EMG? Oh, yeah. Yep. All right. Let's get the floral back in. We're too low. We need the floral in. And I need the pedicle finder. We're going to aim higher, see if we can't go a little more north. Okay, good job, Dr. Patel. Let's get the floral in and let's get a shot. Nice. I go a little more north. If I can't get this, then I'm just going to leave the screw out. Shot. That looks pretty good, huh? Definitely not low. All right, what size screw is that? 
Luis. Six five. Let's have a tap. Yeah. I'm gonna see if this works. You guys, watch that stuff. Yeah. Unfortunately, shot. Shot. Anything? What is that? What tap is that? That's a 6.5 tap. Uh, uh, why are we? Okay, because we're using a 7.5 screw? Yeah, the, the yeah. Is Shot. That feels good. It's way away from the bottom of the pedicle this time. So it should work. We need some gel foam. Yep, a bunch of gel foam. Take this, gel foam. You take this, give me the gel foam. I'm gonna pack the gel foam into the pedicle. Ball tip probe, ball tip, move that, ball tip probe. Yep, nice, screw. Nice, nice, nice. Watch it. So, let's see if this works. I'll be amazed if it works. With his bad pedicles and all, I'll be amazed. I am leaning hard. Shot. I am aiming and leaning hard. I can't lean any harder. No. I don't mean my body. I mean my screw trajectory is leaning hard. Shot. It means it's... It's... I'm, I'm way out here with my hand trying to get medial because of scoliosis. Well, let's try this stimulation again. Ready? It's going to be right two. Huh? Ten? All right, good. I feel good about that. Ten is our threshold. Okay. Left, three. Left three. Woo! We just lost 50 more cc's of blood. So, huh? Oh no! But what? Are you going beyond 10? I want you to go beyond 10. I said I don't care if it's over 10. I just want you. You got to go up to whatever you go up to 40. But I just want to know that it's breaking above 10. Some. Some of you guys like 43, 42 and a half, 41.8. I don't give a shit. Right, if it's over 10, that's what I care about. Right, but you need to do the full spectrum of, of tests. Not for me, but for medical legal reasons. It's fine. Okay, left L4. Left L5. We're going to do left five. We did not put a screw in right five. We left it out. We could not put one. Unable to place. Bring the table down, please. Why are you guys keeping the table up? It was up for the screw, and that's it. Left We're nowhere near ready for that. Right, uh, right, uh, yeah, it just needs to be on the metal, Dr. Patel. Right, L5. What was left five? Left S1. 33. And right S1. 39. Right, one more. Didn't get it. All right. I'll need to bend this. Holy crap. We have, uh, That's fine. Snow, you know. No, 
Put it on my fingers. You have a persuader? I need to back this screw out a little bit. Give me a, a screwdriver. What the, no, I don't want the persuader. I asked if they have a persuader. I'm not asking for a persuader. There's a difference. Set screw. Jesus Christ. may need the persuader next. And a set screw. Why is this not seating? These set screws seem like they're harder to seat than the uh, other system that you guys have had. I mean, they're buttress screws. They look fine by design, but there's some reason. I need a, I need a rod. They appear to me to be more difficult to seat, especially when the rod's a little high profile in the tulip head. I need a bender. Yeah, we're gonna have to bend the heck out of this one. Oh boy. Is it long enough is the real question. I don't know that it's long enough. This is the short end of the curve. Yeah, it should be long enough. All right, yeah. So, so this is an interesting point. This is where we get a little more what we call derotation. So when you're dealing with a scoliosis patient and you're trying to fix their curve and get it straightened out, we call it derotation. And one of the ways to derotate is to put those cages in like we did earlier in the inner body space. Another way to facilitate derotation is the cutting out the facets like we did. And then you can actually use your rod if you bend it properly and you have good hardware and good purchase you can use your rod to pull this, the deep side of the spine towards you, up towards you. We call it reducing the spine to the rod. And that is too much to ask there. That is too much to ask. So, bender, come on. So I need to bend a little more. The other thing about rods, you don't want to bend it in one place. You always want to spread your bend over a, as wide an area as you can. This is called rod contouring. And honestly, when I started spine surgery back in 97, we were still using a, a system that really didn't have polyaxial heads. And you actually had to contour the rod completely. And there were some impossibilities there, some very difficult contouring that had to take place. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to back the screw out a little bit. Let me have the um, screwdriver. So the development of the polyaxial screw head, the one that moves around like we have here now, everybody uses it. Back in the, 
I don't even know when. A guy named Mickelson developed it. He's an orthopedic spine surgeon. Anyway, Dr. Mickelson, oh, he doesn't practice anymore because he's a gazillionaire. Happy for him, but he's made all of our lives easier. Please don't hit my head. Dr. Mickelson developed that technology of the polyaxial head. And now we all benefit from it because it's made spine surgery a lot easier to do when it was almost impossible back in the day, bending these rods to fit the fixed angle heads that were being used. We used to use things like claws and wires to hold things together and they sucked big time. They were not a good solution. No, I don't need that. I need another set screw. Anyway, I was trained on the old hardware and the new hardware. So I have the best of all worlds. Being trained on the old hardware, you learn how to overcome challenges and problems with the hardware, like contouring the rods properly. You understand reduction. What's going on here? I just need another set screw, guys. All right. All right, let me try the persuader. Let me try your persuader. Hold on, let me see if I can seat this without the persuader. Yeah, see, I used to be able to seat that. I really don't like this. I don't like the fact that it's harder to seat these set screws on this system. It's not like, it's not, no, it's not your handle. It's the screw, the set screw. Don't insult my intelligence. It's funny. You have really no idea who I am. But then again, I don't expect you to. Set screw. This is our last set screw. Uh, what's going on there? I don't think you need the bone wax. So as long as it doesn't fall off. All right. Thank you. So, and I wonder if the bone wax is causing it to to just not seat right. Probably need a millimeter here. What in God's great earth is happening here? <sighs> Whoever designed this system should be. Th this set screws, there's something wrong with it. Is there something in the way? Because I don't see anything. There we go. Yeah, that's a, that's a bad set screw. Take it out of my set, please. All right. Beautiful. Easy, easy. You're sucking everything out. We're going to put a cross link. A lot of doctors, I am. A lot of doctors, man, they're still using these old cross links. I'll just do one. These cross links, uh, a lot of surgeons don't put them in. I, I rarely see anybody. They don't understand the biomechanics of the spine. They leave these cross links out. But a cross link is like a cross brace in engineering. It prevents rotation. We're tightening these screws up now. We're doing what's called a, a 
final tightening. And I always save the crosslink for last. I think I've over tightened the crosslink. Let me have a crosslink driver. I just made it a little too snug. It's not moving out of the way from the counter torque device that I'm using for the set screws. All right, questions from our audience, Henry? No current questions. Okay, great. Do we have big irrigation? I want some big irrigation with betadine. We're just about done. Dr. Patel, I appreciate your help today. As always, you are amazing. And I think this patient's going to be happy with the results. Uh, we got the nerves well decompressed. Do you see any SSEP changes? Really? Because normally SSEPs improve after surgery like this. You saw nothing? Interesting. Okay. Great. All right. So next we're going to do the second. We're going to do the uh, clear irrigation. Then we're going to do a drain and expiral. Yeah, we need some gel foam too. So the betadine is an antiseptic. Here you go. Let's go. I don't know what Oscar is doing over there, but let's move things along. Gel foam. Don't move. Don't move your hand. It makes it harder. I don't know how much you guys can see, Henry, of what's in here. We can see for the most part everything except the L2, uh, the L3. All right, good. You're able to see the hardware tuck, please? Of course. All right, we're done. Take that. Let's get our drain. Oh. Ay, 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 Dr. Patel, what are you doing? You want to do the expiro? Yeah, we need to put some bone graft in. We're going to put this bone graft in laterally. We've already basically um, decorticated these posterior elements. So we're packing the graft in on the lateral to the hardware. This is the posterior fusion part. AKA posterior lateral fusion it means lateral is to the side. Posterior is in the back. You want to get it onto the bone. That's good. A little vancomycin. Now we put a little antibiotic in here. Prevent an infection. We're going to put some Expiro. Go ahead. Guys, start cleaning this stuff up. You can't have this here. Okay? Move all this stuff out. If you leave, leave all the hard stuff here, we're not going to have room. So Dr. Patel is injecting Expiro into the muscle. Expiro is a pain medicine. It's basically non-narcotic bupivacaine, which is a numbing medicine. Hold on. I want to get this stuff out of here. And one of the important things about spine surgery through the back is to keep the muscles alive, you want to protect them and treat them well. That's what we do here at Duke Spine. We use a special technique to do that. You finished? Nice. All right, now when you're closing, stitch. Oh yeah, drain, thank you. We're gonna put our drain in. Take that. Let me have that. Let me have that. Because I'm hitting the iliac crest. 
You want to come in under the fascia because you're going to be closing the fascia. Should be right there. Grab the drain, pull it through. Don't injure the end because the suction won't ever happen. This is a big wound, so we're going to use the whole drain. Now, well, maybe we'll cut just a little bit. You want to cut between the, the holes. Ow! Just kidding. And you want it to be submuscular, under the muscle. Stitch. Great job, everyone. Dr. Patel, if you need to get out of here, go for it, man. I appreciate your help. Thank you. You can get out of here. Thanks so much. Pickups. So I'm going to close the fascia. Can you all see? The fascia is this thick white stuff. The muscle is underneath. We don't want to close the muscle. And you want to look here. You see the fascia there, Henry? Yes, we do. So I'm going to stay right on top of it and just grab the fascia. This is the layer you close first, fascia. Okay. You don't want to sew the drain in either. If you sew the drain in, watch it. You don't want to put your hand there. The needles are going to come flying in there. If you sew the muscle, you're going to end up hurting the muscle, devascularizing, and then the patient's going to have more pain. So don't sew the muscle, just sew the fascia. The next layer after this will be the subcutaneous tissues, and then after that it will be basically the skin. We put staples. Good job. Oscar. All right, now if you notice my sewing technique, I do two knots. Oh wait, yeah, good job. Um, and Luis has loaded the, the needles perfectly. I'll show you how to load the needle properly for the young aspiring surgeons out there. Yeah, yeah for, for sure, go ahead. Thanks for asking. All right, when you want to load a needle properly, you guys see this? You want to always grab at the back of the needle right before the, the tube, before it connects to the suture, to the flat part. You want to angle it slightly forward this way on my side. And you don't want it rolling. All right, fantastic. You can take the suction off, suction, because there's no blood. I would, if you do oh. suction, I would take the thing off here because it's too strong. Okay. You, you don't want to suck the vanco out. That's vanco my, no, 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 no I don't want it off. Yeah. I'm not talking to you. Yeah. I'm talking to these guys. This is a on the surgical field issue. Well, I got to commend everybody. What is this? Why is this moving? Don't let that fall. You all did a great job. We haven't done a fusion like this in a while. Most of you have probably never done it with me at all, right? Since we don't do very much of these. Any questions, Henry? No current questions. All right, well, let's wrap it up. We're pretty much done. You can end the stream and take a break, man. Great job. Copy that. Great work, everybody. Thank you.